Okay, Chair, we're now streaming live on YouTube. I'll hand the meeting over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to East Devon District Council's Cabinet meeting for the 13th of July 2022. I'm your Chair Councillor Paul Arnott. Welcome to everybody watching the meeting via live streaming. Based on a decision of the Council to continue virtual meetings until the 31st of October 2022, I'd like to remind both members and public attending or watching that this Council has delegated much of its decision-making process powers to our senior officers. May I remind members that the Code of Conduct applies throughout this meeting and we reserve the right to remove or disconnect any participant disrupting by whatever means. Uh, please can you remember to turn your telephones off or to silent. If we lose the connection, we'll try and get back on, but if after 15 minutes we can't, we'll have to adjourn the meeting and you'll be able to find details of a reconvened meeting at eastdevon.gov.uk where you can also find tonight's agenda. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with yourself, Councillor Arnott. Uh, present. Councillor Haywood. Present, thank you. Councillor Hookway. Uh, present, thank you. Councillor Jackson. Present, thank you. Councillor Young. Present, thank you. Councillor Ledger. Present, thank you, Amanda. Councillor Rickson. Present, thank you. And Councillor Rowland. Present, thanks, Amanda. Thank you all. I can confirm your core at chair. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda and committee. Uh, we now go on to agenda item one, uh, public speaking. Uh, we have uh, four public speakers uh, this evening. Uh, two who are going to discuss the Colourful Community Governance Review item, uh, which comes up later. Uh, one, we have uh, Councillor Mike Goodman with a number of questions, and then we have Councillor Paul Miller. So if um, Amanda is, is, is Mr Ian Priestley there and ready to... Yes, he is. He's in the meeting. OK, thank you. Mr Priestley, over to you, please, for your three minutes. Good evening. Would it be possible to speak at item 19 or would you like me to speak now, Chairman? Well, it's interesting, Mr Priestley. I was considering that that might be quite... Uh, I'd have to check with Ken, Ken, Mr Parr, if you're present, would you be content to wait until item 19 to speak as well? Or would you um, rather speak now? Unfortunately, Mr Chairman, I've got another meeting I've got to go to, so I won't be here by then. OK, fair enough. In which case, um, let's let's go ahead now then, please, Mr Priestley. OK, absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ian Priestley, and I'm the chairman of the Colourful Residents Association. Um, first, I'd like to thank Henry Gordon Lennox and his team for the enormous amount of work that's gone on so far on this project. I must also thank Colourford Steering Group for their hard work and their lessons to all of us in communication skills. The village has been keenly following events with many folk following, with many folk attending various open meetings. And now, as I can see, a healthy majority of them have completed the EDDC consultation forms. You may already know that the Colford Residents Association has a clear vision and the blueprint for the new village council, including costings, benefits, legacy issues, and potential risks. There is a very solid plan. This includes a clear way forward and preparing guidance for a new council. We intend to set up various working groups, such as finance or traffic or amenity projects, in preparation of the final proposal in December of this year. This will hopefully engage and infuse, and infuse a few more of our skilled residents. We've been in regular communication with EDDC and various other organisations, such as other parish councils in the area. And we are now eager to agree to a robust proposal from you. The proposed boundary looks good to us, looks good to the steering group. And although I've, I've received a few comments from a couple of people to say that um, the border is actually dissecting their property. So it just needs a tiny bit of fine tuning, perhaps just a sharper pencil. We we'll look forward to continue working with you all and to build on this solid set of results from the consultation. A set of numbers which paints a true picture of the majority of people's feelings. Thank you very much.
Mr. Arnott, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Priestley. You're obviously ready to go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Park, can we come to you next, please? Hello, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I start? Yeah. Yes, please do. Three minutes. Thank you. I'm Andrew Parr. I'm Chairman of uh, Collison Parish Council, and I'm here representing the Future Parish Council tonight about the item um, of Colliford Colliton um, governance. Now, the recommendation is for a new parish council for Colliford. Collison have been made very clear, the parish council has made very clear that they're against this proposal. Um, and I note from the consultation document that most of the, the, the vast majority of comments uh, generally express disagreement with the principle of separation. Yet they're still suggesting that you should go ahead with separation. Now, Colliford's application is very impressive, but it's built on two um, fallacies. First of all, the parish councillors on the Colliford parish councillors on the parish council were frustrated um, and angered, and uh, they resigned. Well, two did resign, but they were the ones who always wanted their own way and were not willing to go through the democratic process. At the moment, we've got four parish councillors from Colliford on the parish council. They're good, constructive people, and there is no limit as to how many they can have on the parish council. So in theory, Collie Ford could have a majority. And secondly, finance. Now, I know going straight to the bottom line, um, the, the, they're talking about a budget for the first year of £49,270. Well, the budget for Colleton, which would at the moment includes Collie Ford, is £75,166. Now, if you were to divide that by the heads, then the budget part of that to go into Collie Ford would be just under £20,000. So there is an increase of £29,000. Now, this has not been explained, and it's not explained where that money is coming from. And I do think that that is an omission. And finally, the boundary. Now, the boundary, Collie Ford never had a parish, so it's not a parish boundary. It is an arbitrary line that has been drawn. And there are a number of people um, who are very angry about it because they are now in Colliford when they have no connection with Colliford. If there is going to be a boundary drawn, there must be much clearer consultation uh, with all parties, including the parish council. So I would ask you not to accept this proposal tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Parr. Um, I won't say much uh, at the moment because I will be disclose. I will be declaring an interest in this as a Colton Parish Councillor in a second. The only reassurance I can give you as a fact is that I know that there is going to be further consultation on the boundary, and, and I think that is recorded in the uh, in in the report as well. Um, okay, right. Next, we come to um, with thanks to Mr. Priestley and Mr. Parr. You're very welcome to continue uh, in the meeting um, during question time, and then um, you will be put in the waiting room and you can carry on watching on YouTube if you like. Uh, the next item, we come to questions from Mr. Mike Goodman. So, um, good evening, uh, Mr. Goodman. We've got three questions from you. Um, I'll just say what they are and then what the answers are to them and you're able to answer, ask a supplementary for each if you wish. So um, the first question from uh, Mr. Goodman was, at the cabinet meeting on the 4th of May, it was agreed that the further cabinet meeting was required to agree and discuss a number of issues regarding the car parking strategy, including reviewing the strategy itself. Many members said they wanted this meeting ASAP. They recognized, I believe, the important this item is to the residents of East Devon. I note that to date it has not been included on a cabinet agenda item. Can cabinet agree today when this meeting will take place and put it on the forward plan? And the answer to that is the invitation and papers for consideration in connection with motorhomes and camper vans were sent to relevant officers and stakeholders from Devon County Council, Exmouth Town Council and East Devon District Council on the 10th of June informing the recipients that a workshop meeting had been arranged for the 11th of July, that's two days ago. That workshop meeting has taken place and was chaired by Councillor Jack Rowland as the finance portfolio holder, uh, under whose remit car parking now comes. And notes of that meeting are in the process of being prepared 
to assist EDDC officers with the aim of bringing a recommendation report to the September meeting of the EDDC cabinet. Um, uh, Mr. Goodman, would you like to ask a supplementary in relation to that? No, not at all, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, the second question was this. On February 2nd, I asked Cabinet about the implementation of EV points after the Cabinet agreed on the 17th of March 2021 to install 30 EV points in East Devon. I was told there have been some complex issues to resolve in terms of further rollout, but we will deliver these as soon as possible. The reply was very disappointing, given so many other places in the southwest have already installed EV points in council-controlled car parks. I noticed that some work has started, has started, and can Cabinet confirm when all 30 points will be installed and plans to extend this further? Uh, the answer is this. Uh, we continue to work hard with the charge point operators to install charging points. However, issues outside of our control have impeded the entire project overall. For example, we have seen a shortage of charging units and time delays in acquiring the distribution network operator DNO permissions. The project has recently seen installations become operational in other partner authorities and East Devon will shortly also have operational units. Works to undertake civils, that's the preparatory work, is now beginning and we hope to see the first charges becoming operational in August, following the DNO connections being completed. Further charging units will follow in September. Leases have been granted for charging point installations at 12 sites, with a further four sites to follow shortly. For the 12 sites granted permission, a total of 46 charging bays will be provided, and we are continuing to identify suitable sites for further phases of the project. Um, finally, I don't know if we can do this technically, but let's have a go. Um, I think, I believe this to be a well-known place uh, to you, Mr. Hume, which is the, uh, the Roxburgh Car Park in Sidmouth. I hope you can see that and you can see the work that's started there already. But would you like a supplementary, Mr. Yeah, Hume? thank you. Thank you very much for that um, answer. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, what I would just um, ask Council, that the demand of e-points is increasing. We all know that as more and more people take up EV cars and that's something we all would agree but it can take depending on the type of charge up to 12 hours to charge a car is the council going to be looking going forward to include fast and rapid chargers charges because that is something that i think our our tourists and residents if they haven't got their own charging points would be looking for chairman Thank you, Mr. Goodwin, for that. And well, that, that point's duly noted, and I, I would imagine widely agreed with as well. Uh, and then the final question was um, regarding the LED strategy, uh, and it's an agenda item later. Um, I highlighted at the forum meeting on the 7th of June several issues. It was disappointing it took till the 5th of July to answer my questions, which I'm sure Cabinet will agree is disappointing. Also, as of July the 11th, I have still not received the Grant Thornton report. I'm pleased that after my questions on equalities, the officer completed a detailed equalities assessment. Can I ask Cabinet to make public the Grant Thornton report public and explain why the LED strategy still says the impact on equalities is low, which is not correct? And the answer to that is there is no report to publish or share from Grant Thornton. The supporting equalities impact assessment identifies the impact as low which is reflected in the report assessment. And if I can just add there, Mr. Goodman, I understand actually there was a, a good deal of correspondence uh, between you and the officer responsible uh, prior to um, his answer uh, on the uh, 11th of July or later on. So back to you, Mr. Goodman, for a supplementary. Thank you. What I, I just want to try to keep both points. And I do thank Mr. Davey on Monday sending me the email um, regarding the Grant Thornton report. But this is a document that measures expenditure and the quality of virtually all services controlled by the council that enables them to compare themselves with other councils. I'm sure this document is discussed by all services and the cabinet each year, although I can find currently no record in cabinet minutes, scrutiny minutes or the audit. And can Cabinet confirm that they have made a decision to accept the high cost of leisure? It is so. Have they made any investigation to understand why the costs are so high compared with other councils? Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Uh, those those points are duly noted. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. that. Right, we now come uh, to uh, Councillor Paul Miller. Uh, Councillor Miller, please. Councillor Miller has given his apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Amanda, um, a pleasure deferred, in which case uh, we come to the minutes for our previous meetings, the 8th and the 29th of June 2022. Uh, if anyone has a comment uh, on either of those sets of minutes, uh, please raise your electronic hand. Uh, if no hands are raised, I'll take this as an indication that you will agree the minutes of the previous meeting. I'm looking now for any hands raised. I see no ships. There we go. OK, thank you very much. The minutes of those previous meetings are recommended to be agreed. Uh, agenda item three is apologies, Amanda. I have one cabinet apology, and that's from Councillor John Loudon. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I have a, an apology from uh, Councillor Sarah Chamberlain as well, um, who is recovering from illness and back next week. Right, now we come to our favourite um, item, agenda item four, the declarations of interest. Um, when your name is called and mindful of the new code of conduct, please state your declaration including which item your declaration relates to, state exactly what the interest is and the specific type of interest you are declaring. Amanda, please, um, off you go. Thank you. I'll start with yourself, Councillor Arnott. Right. OK, thank you. I'm going to declare um, a, an effect prejudicial NRI in two items, both related to Colleton. And the first one is agenda item 19, 18, which is the Colliford Community Governance Review. I am a parish councillor uh, at Colleton, uh, and Colliford is part of Colleton Parish Council at the moment. And I am also going to declare an interest on the LED item, uh, which members will be able to see is item number uh, 13, I think. Uh, and that's the same, which is it concerns um, in part uh, the uh, Colson Grammar School facility. So I'm going to declare as a parish councillor an FX prejudicial NRI as well. I'm also going to ask Councillor Haywood to chair item 18, if that's okay, please, as the deputy. Oh, cool. Can I just very quickly, uh, Mr. Gordon and Alex, have I, do you think I've got that item, uh, the LED um, declaration correct? Uh, when I was mentioning it to you earlier, I was talking about item eight, which is the minutes from the LED monitoring forum. Right. Is that, is that what right. you were thinking? I, that you were yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what it's. So item eight, in fact, yeah. please. Uh, no, eight. Just eight, eight. Item eight. Item eight. Okay, so I'm declaring item eight, but I'm also declaring item 18 as yes. well. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, may I declare an effects NRI? Uh, in respect of my employment as the clerk of Axminster Town Council, in respect of agenda item 11, which is simply the minutes of the Asset Management Forum held on 21st of June, I did chair that meeting, but the outcome of that, which was the adoption of the policy, uh, may have an impact on the authority, but again, it's an FX NRI only. Thank you. Councillor Hookway. And thank you, Amanda. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Amanda. Um, two, uh, one on item 11, um, which I have an effects NRI, uh, but I'm not required to disclose the nature of that interest as it's a sensitive interest as per section 32 of the localism Act 2011. Um, and the other one is an effects NRI on item 18. With respect to being a portfolio holder, I've had um, uh, a number of discussions uh, with a couple of individuals in relation to uh, the Qualiford Community Governance Review. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Young. None, thank you, Amanda. Councillor Ledger. None, thank you, Amanda. Councillor Rickson. None, thank you. Councillor Rowland. And none from me, thanks, Amanda. Okay, thank you, Chair. You're on mute. Oh, I've got, yes, I've got a bit to say, haven't I? I haven't finished. Excuse me, for the rest of the councillors in the meeting who want to declare an interest that may affect their ability to rain, remain in the meeting for any item listed on the agenda. If you have one, please, can you indicate now? Councillor Skinner. Uh, on thank you on the agenda item oh, seventeen, Broad Henbury Parish Council, the corporate governance review. That I am the ward member for Broad Henbury Parish Council. Um, I don't know what that comes under Henry, but whatever that does, um, it's just to mention that as uh, as, mm. uh, as an interest as representing Broad Henbury Parish Council as a ward member. Thank you. No, I don't, oh, I don't have to declare it, apparently. Sorry about that then, Chair. <laughs> Wasted your time. <laughs> Councillor Johns. Um, item 12, the Minutes of the Art and Culture Forum, held on the 15th of June 2022. I work for an art academy. Um, I don't, as I'm not voting in Cabinet anyway, and it is just the minutes, I'm assuming it's just a personal interest, Henry? We don't do personal interest now, Vicky. Well, whatever interest it is, I, I was most confused by your reply to my original question about it in the first place. So I'm not sure what interest it is, but I know that I've been told there is one, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> right. So your, your interest in that meeting was because you were there as a representative of Ottery St Mary Town Council, not as a not as a district councillor. So here you're uh, as a district councillor, but you're not actually involved in the discussion and the decisions in relation to those minutes. Uh, so I, I don't actually think you're going to be involved in the sense of needing to declare. Um, but if you did want to, then I would suggest it's going to be an effects NRI on the basis that you are or you were a representative there of Ottery St Mary Town Council. OK. What Henry said. <laughs> Thank you. So are you wishing to declare an interest then, Councillor Johns, on the advice of Henry? On, on the advice of Henry, as he said it this evening, probably not. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Back to you, Chair. One, I'm wondering, Councillor Johns, uh, perhaps, well, far be it from me, but I think an effects NRI might cover you there. Just might, if I were you, I'd suggest you declare that. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll go. I'll go with our, our valiant leader. Well, just you know. It's advice you don't have to take it, and I'm not sure. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the reply that I got from Henry just because I don't understand legalese as to whether or not I am supposed to declare or not, and I would rather be 100% above board than even 95%. So, yes, I will go with Councillor Arnold's suggestion, please. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, just to make that clear then, Henry, can you help me here, please? Councillor yes, Johns uh, is, is submitting a, a, a declaration of interest. Right. And affects NRI for On the basis what reason? Osry St Mary Town Council the representative at the meeting. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, okay, agenda item five is a uh, letter. Yes. Councillor Moulding has his hand up. Yeah. Oh, I'm. Thank you, Councillor Haywood, uh, Deputy um, Chair of the meeting. Uh, apologies, Councillor Moulding. Over to you, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. I believe I may need to declare an interest on item 13, which is the East Devon District Council Ledger and Built Facility Strategy, because I believe that Cloakham Lawn Sports Centre is mentioned within that report. And as president of Cloakham Lawn Sports Centre, I believe I should declare an effects NRI declaration. If Henry could just confirm. <laughs> it's obviously down to you, Andrew, which one it is. So uh, I presume that appears on your register of interest as an ORI. It does. Yes, it, it does. does. It does what's in the strategy directly relate to the finances or well-being of that interest. 
I um, think it probably I mean, does. No, no, no um, I have no pecuniary interest in it whatsoever. No, it's not so pecuniary. It's whether it affects the finances of that other registered interest or its no. well-being. If it's in our strategy, there's a yep. fair chance that it's going to trigger that, I think. So yep. I, I suggest you're probably more, you're probably going to be better off declaring it as a directly relates ORI, but that's going to preclude you from being involved. Okay. Quite happy to do that. Directly related ORI, whatever Henry said. Directly, yeah, directly relates ORI. Yeah. Okay. Well done, Andrew. We'll get we'll we'll get this one day. <laughs> it's really hard, isn't it? Right. Ah, we have the chair of Devon County Council, Councillor Ian Hall, please. Thank you, Chair. Looking for guidance um, here. I used to be the chair of Clopham Lawn Sports Centre. And I was the vice president of Clocum Lawn Sports Centre. I am neither now. Um, my declarations of interest have been submitted, but I do not know if they've been signed off by uh, SMT. It, it, it just might seem just check it, double check to, to, to do a sense check on it, really. Um, so uh, if you're no longer either of those or hold either of those positions, then that's not going to amount to an interest. OK, but I will declare that I am the chair of Axminster Skate Park, which is in around that footprint, but that area of land is now under the ownership of East Devon District Council. Okay. So, so what are you I'll... declaring, Councillor Hall, then? What is the nature of the, or not the, not the nature of the interest, what type of interest are you declaring there? Well, all I'm saying, Leader, is that that skate park area is, is the, within the facility of Cloakham Lawns, historic and it may be it may be seen of being in that footprint you yeah, know understand that the question is what what type of um, um of interest are you declaring you know is it, is it, it, it in old money it would have been a personal interest chair um chair. But, but it's, it's, it's not as easy as saying that so <laughs> is is that uh, an, uh, another register for interest does it does it feature on your register of interest the, the skate the park, skate park has been on my register of interest for a considerable amount of so, time, Henry. So does the decision that's required tonight affect the uh, financial interests or well-being of the skate park? No. No. So uh, at best, then, you're going to be talking about an effects NRI. Thank you for the clarification. Are you declaring that, then, Councillor Hall, an effects NRI? I think to cover all bases, I think I need to, Chair. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, any more hands up? I can't see anybody. Amanda, anybody else we need to deal with? Um, Councillor Moulding is still got his hand oh. up. I think he wants to come back. Back he comes. Councillor Moulding, you're on mute. Yes, if I could come back, Chair. Uh, really, just following Councillor Hall's reference to Axminster Skate Park, if there is a and affects NRI to, in conjunction with that. I am a trustee of Axminster Skate Park and should declare a similar effects NRI interest. Okay. So you're, you're already out because of the earlier one. So uh, we'll, we'll note it, but you don't, you don't need to because you're not going to be involved anyway. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can't see any other hands. Uh, in which case, let us proceed with some relief mm -hmm. to agenda item five. Let's get some business done. So we have a one late report, uh, which officers recommend should be dealt with as a late item or matter of urgency. Uh, it's a very interesting one about the UK Shared Prosperity Fund Investment Plan. Uh, and we have a report here from Rob Murray, our Economic Development Manager, and Tom Winters, Economic Development Officer. I don't know which one of you um, chaps are. Right, over to you, Rob, please. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, an apology for this um, having to be presented as an urgent item. Uh, as many members will be aware, um, since I report to Cabinet on the 4th of May, following the prospectus uh, for the UK Shared Prosperity Fund being published, we've been working to quite a tight development and submission deadline for the investment plan, actually, in just over two weeks' time. Um, this is alongside ensuring um, quite extensive stakeholder consultation to inform the investment plan content and decision making uh, by a reasonably newly formed pr um, programme management panel in agreeing final content 
um, this the open approach that we've taken uh, has meant that feedback on the investment plan has been received up until the end of last week. So I do apologise. Hopefully that gives some context. The report is urgent by necessity in accommodating this engagement and certainly not by design. Um, mindful that today is a very full agenda and the need for brevity. So um, I'll quickly cover some of the context of the report. Uh, a previous cabinet report in May provided an overview of the published SPF or Shared Prosperity Fund prospectus. Uh, this followed the broader levelling up white paper, which the SPF is designed to help deliver. In a nutshell, our previous report uh, made clear that for East Devon District Council to unlock our £1.8 million or uh, one. 0.796.363 pounds allocation of UK shared prosperity funding. Um, an investment plan must be developed in partnership with local stakeholders and submitted to the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, or DLUC, as is their current acronym, prior to the 1st of August. Uh, so as now set out in the current report, some key updates. We have been successful in engaging and consulting with uh, representatives from quite a broad range of sectors, services and organisations. Uh, they now comprise our local partnership group, which you'll see listed in section 3.4 of the report. A full list is provided there. They've been engaged in the development of the plan. This LPG group um, have been instrumental, as have the Devon Business and Economy Recovery Group uh, and relevant East Devon District Council officers um, in informing the development of our current investment plan, which you'll find at Appendix A of the report. With more than 20 project concept forms being submitted in recent weeks, these are all focused on the three shared prosperity um, fund investment priorities of communities in place, supporting local business and people and skills. Uh, in bringing together our SPF governance structure as also illustrated in the report, we've established a program management panel comprising a cross party group of members who've ensured that SPF decision making is democratic, transparent um, and has reflected local need uh, in developing this final version of our investment plan. Um, I'll quickly now hand over to Tom, our economic development officer, who's been expertly project management expertly project managing the development of our investment plan um, and Tom I think you'll update on the consultation process and our final list of interventions within the plan. Yes thank you very much Rob yeah so just to give um, members a reminder in terms of the consultation since the uh, previous cabinet report on the 4th of May we had an initial stakeholder briefing session, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 18th of May uh, to give our stakeholders a, an idea of what UKSPF was all about. Um, we then also held an inception meeting on the 1st of June, where we tried to get an idea of the local need um, and demand for some of the types of projects and interventions that UKSBF will be uh, replacing in terms of previous EU funds. Um, we've also let um, community organisations and other providers who aren't inside that stakeholder group to contact us directly as well through our, our website. Um, we then provided a, an update session on the 5th of July to those stakeholders to give them um, a sort of an idea of where we were in terms of development of the investment plan. Um, and in conjunction with those meetings, we've had panel meetings as well. So those are, that's the um, councillor panel that Rob mentioned. And um, again, another briefing session for them and also another session for them to decide which interventions they wanted us to progress with in that investment plan. Um, so a final copy of that investment plan um, was finished on Monday of this week. And in that contained 12 interventions, I'll, I'll give a very quick overview of, of those. Um, so that included an action on poverty fund, which is a grant scheme to local community organisations to help uh, alleviate poverty in East Devon. Um, there's an East Devon Council for Voluntary Service, which will help uh, coordinate local voluntary groups, uh, support for funding bids and things of that nature. Uh, there's an active travel fund, um, which will be funding to help increase take up of walking and cycling in the district. Uh, there's a culture programme which will aim to uh, help fund local cultural attractions and to increase um, volunteering in that sector. 
Uh, there's a leisure programme which will aim to increase take up of existing leisure provision, particularly of those uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. There's a net zero innovation fund, which will provide grant funding to local businesses uh, who have um, sort of new product ideas, which will lead to net zero innovations. There's a sustainable tourism fund, um, which will enable uh, a sort of stewardship scheme to help green up our existing uh, tourism base here in East Devon. There's a feasibility, a town's feasibility scheme, which we're looking to do some feasibility studies for our various towns to help bring about funding bids to much larger pots, be those government or internal. Um, and the remaining four schemes we're looking to try and do uh, with um, other district councils across Devon, um, and that includes a business support program, so that will help to replace uh, the existing Thrive uh, um, business support provision, which is currently European funded, uh, as well as other uh, support mechanisms as well. And there's an employment support program for local disabled people who are economically inactive uh, and a similar program for those who are neat, so not in employment, education and training, so younger people. Uh, and lastly, there's a scheme to uh, help increase retrofitting skills as well for those who are economically inactive. Um, so th that, that's a, a quick overview of the 12 interventions. Um, we're looking next to get MP endorsement and following that, we look to submit the bid hopefully next week so it's ahead of the 1st of August deadline uh, after that we'll be looking to do some prep for those interventions um, as well as an equality impact assessment and we're looking to hopefully get approval from government in October that's when they intend to um, unlock this funding for all the local areas so um, coming back to the report uh, today so we're looking to uh, um, for your endorsement for this investment plan and to provide delegated authority for the submission of the investment plan as well uh, but in the meantime I'm, me and Rob are happy to answer any questions you may have thank you thank you Tom and Rob uh, can I look for uh, speakers from outside cabinet first please Councillor Bruce Viserum please Yes, good evening. Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. Um, as, as one of the, the members who, who sat on this panel, um, I think that the, the most relevant intervention, and all 12 are very good, uh, speaking as a Little and Ward member, is the support for young, neat residents. Um, as, as we are all aware on this council, that for young people to thrive, education and training skills are the key drivers to better employment prospects and opportunities, and thereby a better future. So to conclude, I hope that all all these projects deliver long-term benefits for our district and its residents and I hope that the government in October as we've heard is able to consider this bid uh, in a most favourable manner. Thank you very much Chair. Thank you Councillor uh, Desaire. Uh, Councillor Megan Armstrong please. Oh, thank you Chair. Yeah just a couple of things. Um, I just wanted to say I'm pleased, very pleased to see that the current uh, Action on Poverty Fund is hoping to be uh, continued through this scheme, uh, which would be really good. Uh, and also the idea for the, because we, we did try in the budget, as you know, to get funding for the, uh, an East Devon CVS, which, um, we, which, which we couldn't afford at the time. So it would be great if we could get the funding for that from this, uh, from this fund. But I also wonder, and it, it's a bit of a silly question in a way, but with everything that's going on in government at the moment, I wonder if any of the officers have had any indication, members have had any indication whatsoever as to whether this will carry on under a new prime minister. Uh, it, I know it's a silly question in some ways, but you, you know how <laughs> things work, people might just whisper things and say, well, actually nothing's guaranteed. So it's just a question I'd like anybody to answer if they can. Thank you. I can certainly respond on that. We've been given no indication whatsoever by the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities that um, this scheme 
um, will be subject to change um, at all. So we, we continue to work to the deadline of su submission on, on or before the 1st of August. Uh, I think what will be important is making sure that we're in early, amongst the early uh, plans to be considered uh, and approved. I think Tom did some maths and I think they may be expecting somewhere in the order of 330 um, investment plans uh, to be considered. So I think it would serve us very well if we were at the forefront of that. Uh, thank you very much. It, it's just I, I know that a lot of the the applicants for the for the top job at the moment. Thank you, if you through chair, uh, uh, are basically saying that you know they want to do a lot of tax cuts and therefore cut back on the funding that's available for for public services and so on. And uh, that just worries me a bit, really. So um, we'll see. And I hope all this great work that's been done on this application isn't wasted. Then good luck with it all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Absolutely. And uh, I think we all know, don't we, sort of mature grown ups, that currently they're pitching to the 200,000 wise men and women who will choose our next Prime Minister for us, as Winston Churchill would have said. So, what they then do the day after they're elected may well be something completely different. Um, but thank you for that, Megan, and also very much for your ongoing work on poverty and I am also I share your um, real pleasure that the Share Prosperity Fund has been is a way of finding uh, of, of supporting it I agree with you you know um, this is advice you know what a pity but so right coming still outside cabinet uh, Councillor uh, Philip Skinner please Thank you. And I just want to make note and say to Tom that uh, an excellent report, Tom and Rob, actually, in, in bringing this forward. Um, and, and I will have a question um, to, to, to end up with. But um, I think it's uh, it's the work that you've put in and driving this forward. And I understand, Rob, why you've um, come to this to get this through the process ASAP. This is not something we want to see slippage on. And I'm hoping and I have no doubt that the cabinet is probably going to put this through. But what I, 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 my question um, really, I guess, to uh, yourself and, and to Tom would be that as far as 11 out funding is going in, in um, unlocking the 1.796363 money that, that, uh, that you've got here within your report, which I think is fantastic. Um, what, is there any funding coming through from, from central government to help us to pay for the things that you guys are doing to help provide the levelling up funding. Is there any support money that happened coming through to East Devon District Council for that? Yes. Well, well Tom, do you want to talk about the administration funding? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, th there is a 4% admin allocation that we're, that we're allowed to tap into as a part of that allocation. Um, so that's something that can potentially be utilised. That's That's been factored in, uh, in terms of the finances. Uh, and I should also mention as well, one of, one of the interventions is the East Devon Towns feasibility work. So that, that will be looking at um, specific uh, assets, sites within uh, the various towns of East Devon uh, to, to look to see whether there are any potential uh, projects there which could be relevant for um, a, a bid to the levelling up fund. Levelling up fund is, is a lot more um, uh, a lot more funding. Um, you know, we're talking tens of millions potentially where, where this is 1.8 across three years. Um, so we're hoping that that work will help to unlock um, future bids, um, which have a very much town's focus uh, in East Devon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Skinner and uh, Rob and Tom there. Uh, we have one more speaker from outside Cabinet, Councillor Mike Allen, please. Thank you, Chair. The, uh, the whole approach is really an excellent one and as usual Rob and Tom have done a very good job pulling it together in such speedy ways. The um, particular uh, areas that I remain concerned about is the uh, number of people who are over 50 years old <coughs> who are uh, thrown out of work and improving their skills and getting them back into work and I'm not sure whether the employment support for those furthest from work uh, th in three years time is, is really answering that particular issue. And I wonder whether or not we should at least take some of this 
suggested funding and make sure that uh, the older group, as well as the neat young group, actually get focused on. And by the same token, I'm not sure why the young neat resident group, again, is uh, in year three. Um, the second thing is the whole approach we've taken is to back growing businesses and particularly fast growth businesses and I'd be very interested in how this scheme meshes with the other activities that we're doing to make sure that we're growing the right businesses across East Devon and not just in the West End and last but not least uh, we know from scrutiny when we were looking at the poverty uh, dashboard which has been renamed the social resilience dashboard that there are somewhere in the region of four and a half thousand people in relative or absolute poverty that's uh, nearly nine percent of the households and I'm concerned that uh, the Action on Poverty Fund is not starting until year two. So part of the question is, what are these dates? Is year one next financial year? When, when in fact, is it aiming to start? I'm sorry if I've misread anything in the agenda, but um, I couldn't figure out when year one started. So... Thank you very much for an excellent set of suggestions. Just what I was hoping that would come forward, but one or two gaps, which I think I would like clarification on. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. Rob, can you help? I, I'll do my best and then I'll hand over to Tom for more of the intelligent detail, if I may. But um, it, you, it's well picked up, Mike, that uh, the need support, um, one of the three interventions under the people and skills um, theme um, all of those are actually in year three and it's a stipulation of the UK SPF uh, prospectus guidance that the people and skills related projects can only be funded in year three I think it's to do with some existing um, schemes continuing to be run over the next year or two but Tom will correct me I'm sure Tom is that broadly accurate that is accurate. Yes. Yeah. ESF funded schemes of people and skills will be ending in, in, in year two, which is the next financial year. We're currently in year one, yeah. I should add. Yeah. So there's not a lot of time left for the year one spend that you do see, but it does comprise the smallest element of the overall allocation. Okay. Uh, and and oh, yes, I'm Councillor Allen, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, fast growth issue. Uh, well, the, the, you'll see one of the interventions listed is the net zero innovation um, element. This builds on the success that we had with our innovation and resilience scheme. Um, we're looking, we were blown away by some of the projects that were unlocked by that scheme. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. You know, carbon capture technology coming out of little old East Devon, that's remarkable. Um, so we're looking to build on that. It, it is a smaller pot. There's no getting away from it. IRF was 2.14 million um, over about six to eight months this is 1.8 million over three years so we'll do what we can with it it's a reasonable enough allocation there are other priorities uh, you, you touched on supporting other businesses we've got the sustainable tourism um, elements uh, as well which um, Nick has been you know instrumental in helping to secure um, and the wider business support so if you like a continuation of the central support that we currently um received through the growth hub there's a lot of opportunity for us to um to make sure that our priority sectors are covered through over the next three years thank you very much thank you councillor allen so now coming back inside cabinet uh councillor paul haywood please thank you right chair um endorsing what uh, uh councillor armstrong and councillor de Sorum have said um and then just come to some thank yous, mate. Uh, you know, 1.8 million seems a lot over three years, 600,000 pounds per year. It's not really a lot of money at all. Barely enough to pay for wallpaper of uh, uh, the flat in Downing Street once per year. But we will do the best with it we can. That's all we can do. Um, thank you to Rob and his team. An incredible effort in a short period of time. Um, and there is always 
a challenge and Councillor Allen has has honed in on this entirely when the panel went through this list if we add to one group we take away from another that's just the nature of uh, finite fi funding and it's unavoidable the, the limits on where we can spend it Rob has kindly outlined that they're outside of our control we, we have to do what uh, the, the, the scheme tells us to otherwise the bid fails at the starting gate um, thank you to all the members of the panel who did have that unenviable task of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And I think with Tom's help and guidance, we've actually cut it down and sliced it to give the maximum benefit to a vast number of people. We know it's not enough. Um, so what I'd like to do, Char, because I'm named as one of the parties that is going to hope you know, endorse any changes, hope there probably won't be any, um, I, I can see Councillor Rowland has his hand up. I'll defer from proposing or seconding simply for that reason, but I do endorse to all cabinet that this is a great opportunity. Uh, it could have been more money, but it's what we've got. So let's make the most of it. And um, I endorse it, but I won't propose or second chair. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much, Councillor Haywood. Coming to Councillor Jack Rowland next. Almost seems as I was teed up then, wasn't it? Well, thank you, Councillor Haywood, but uh, I'm quite happy to, uh, formally recommend acceptance of what's involved here and also echo the congratulations that's been given to uh, uh, Tom and Rob for the uh, tremendous amount of work and also the panel, especially uh, in view of the deadline date of the 1st of August to submit this. I did have a question though related to that um, um, deadline date. We already know from the levelling up fund round two for the Axe Valley bid that we couldn't submit a bid, well, we wanted to by the uh, 6th of July, but the government portal wasn't open to enable that to happen. So everything's been postponed. I don't know if there's been any update on the IT issues. So I sincerely hope that the same IT issues regarding an online process aren't going to apply for this particular scheme as well. Um, I don't know if Rob or Tom have got any update on that. Uh, July issue with the government portal. Um, yes, I, I, I did go, the portal is up, I'm glad to say. Uh, I did have a look through it yesterday and it all looks to be in, in good order. So, and the good thing about applying hopefully next week is that if there are any issues, we've still got enough time to, to fix them. True. But yeah, it's all looking good from our end. Oh, that's good news. Thanks, Tom. Glad to hear that because I, I was wondering whether there's anything more behind, <laughs> behind that particular issue. So thank you. Um, as I said, formally uh, move acceptance of this anyway. Congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Councillor and Cabinet. Can I look for somebody to second that with a yellow hand, please? Councillor Dan Ledger. <laughs> Reflexes win again. Councillor Dan Ledger is to second then. Uh, in which case, can we please, Amanda, go to a vote on that? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you can vote in your usual way, please. And that's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you, Amanda, very much. Uh, thanks, Rob and Tom, for that excellent piece of work. I was going to give advance notice that because of the temperature this evening, uh, I intend to take a five minute break after an hour and a half rather than two hours. So you've only got to solve over another 35 minutes um, before you can go off and wring your shirts out in a bucket or whatever it's getting quite steamy isn't it um so we now go to agenda item six confidential or exempt items there are none um agenda item seven the forward plan uh, are members happy to recommend the forward plan for approval i will take it that they are unless anyhow oh, councillor Rowland, please thank you chair i was going to mention that in view of um the written answer that was given earlier about a report coming through to Cabinet in September in connection with the outstanding issues to do with car parks and motorhomes and camper vans, that that should be included in that forward plan now, because that's only just been agreed with officers in the last couple of days. Henry, is that OK? Yeah, so it depends on whether there is an actual decision that is a key decision that is going to be taken at that meeting as opposed to an update or, or further work. So. This is not just recording all the business of the cabinet, it's, a, it's, it's the legal requirements of what is a key decision. So at this stage, I'm not sure there's uh, absolute clarity of whether it's going to be a key decision. 
so I would suggest for now it, it's it's um, it's probably left. So is there is there going to be a decision that's required at September's cabinet? That's certainly the intention, Henry. But uh, whether we, <laughs> I'll take your advice really, and perhaps I'm not sure whether um, not trying to put Simon on the spot, but whether he wants to comment as to whether he thinks that should be included at this stage. What? I don't know if Simon wants to comment, but the alternative is you agree it and just give me authority to add it if it's viewed as going to be a key decision. I certainly see key decisions coming forward as a result of that report coming through to the Cabinet on this subject, yes. Simon, do you want to split the difference here? What do you think? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. If I can say, if I can liaise with Henry, and if it's necessary, we'll put it on as a key decision. Excellent. Okay. So, Thank so you, Chair, for your very good. That, that seems very well. Thanks for that, Henry. OK, uh, in which case, um, Henry, do we need to actually take a vote on this or can we just say if nobody wants to object, it's, it goes through? Yeah, you can. Yeah, let's do it that way. Yeah, OK. All right. So I can't see anybody. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So the former, the forward plan is therefore recommended for approval. Right. Now, agenda item eight, I am going to uh, bail out of this. Henry, do I have to be ejected or can I just turn my screen off on this since I've declared a, uh, whatever it's called, effects? Yeah, you the waiting room, I'm afraid. Okay. All right. So please send me to the waiting room and, and do ask me back. Come back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we now turn to agenda item eight, which are recommendations from Cabinet that resolve and action being taken from the LED monitoring form on the 7th of June. Uh, you'll see from your agenda pack on page 58, there is one recommendation shown, but actually there's another one, I believe, Henry, from uh, minute entry 11. Yes, that's right. Uh, also has, uh, it's in two parts. So what, they're both classes one, so we'll call one 1A, one 1B. One um, <clears throat> so the recommendations are minute six, draft leisure, strategy, uh, draft leisure and built facility strategy to approve the principle of the draft leisure strategy. And then we scroll down to uh, 11, which is the recommendation to delegate to the service lead, place assets of commercialization in consultation with strategic lead and myself as PH for economy and assets to agree the heads of terms for the new lease and management agreement to achieve the outcomes within this report and to enter new agreements with college and grammar school, 1B, that cabinet recommends to council to provide a capital budget of up to 140,000 pounds to contribute to the school's capital investment works to the all-weather pitch, and by doing so, securing improved future community use. So that's the recommendations in front of you, um, uh, three of them. Um, are there any speakers from outside cabinet? I can't see any hands, any speakers from inside cabinet? So uh, can I ask uh, for a proposal in a seconder? Is that, I guess that's the convention, Henry? Or do we just, yeah, thank you. Uh, so a proposer that we uh, proceed with those, uh, Councillor Ledger, I can see you're proposing, thank you. Councillor Rowland, you've got, you're now, you've got both hands up there, virtual and physical. Uh, seconding, uh, so um, yes, could, uh, Amanda, could you take us to a vote, please? Certainly. Um, Councillors, if you can vote in the usual way, please. Green ticks, red crosses. And that's unanimous in favour of those minutes. And Thank, recommendations. You, Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Thank you. I could kindly retrieve our dear leader from the waiting room. That would be of super. Course. <laughs> Am I back? You are. Oh, that's, thank you very much. I just switched on Channel 4 News. I better turn that off then. That was quick. Thank you, very, thank you, Councillor Haywood, for that. Um, if only I could be as quick as you on that. Fantastic. So we now come to agenda item nine, the minutes of the scrutiny committee held on the 9th of June, 2022. Cabinet, you can find there's a recommendation here on page 65 of the agenda uh, and it relates to um, whether to uh, set up an uh, online petition facility of some kind. So can I first ask for any speaker who'd like to address this from outside of cabinet first please. 
Councillor Mike Allen, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think the overall uh, view of scrutiny about this was that uh, petitions are a critical importance to the voice of the public reaching East Devon District Councillors. And what we were missing was any electronic version. Uh, so <clears throat> that was the recommendation. And secondly, we perhaps could publicize the council's petition scheme via the weekly press release so that people know what the rules are. Um, it's nothing to do with whether or not the 150 was right or wrong in terms of the threshold. It's purely to make sure that people know the best way and the easiest way of submitting a, a, a petition. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, I should just say for the record, I'm sure you wouldn't want it to be like that the, the decision made um, on the recommendation of the officers in relation to the car park petition, I have no doubt was completely factually correct. Um, so uh, Councillor Paul Hayward, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, from a transparency sense, um, I think petitions are an important way for uh, people who are, don't hold elected positions to get their view across. Um, from a practical point, this council and every other council in the UK is currently under huge financial pressures and constraints to carry on delivering core services at a point where our costs are rising by 10%, but our ability to increase our revenue is not uh, so uh, generous. Um, and so I, I personally am I, unsure about this because I did a Google search earlier and the first page of a, and other search engines are available, let's be fair, um, brought up 10 well-known uh, uh, options uh, and channels to create petitions. So anyone who's doing this electronically, you know, to create something new on our platform, that's work, that's cost to strata, cost to us, cost to officers, it's got to be managed, it's got to be updated, it's got to be refined. That's more cost. That's more officer time. We're struggling with staffing resource as it is. So to actually consider something that's going to make our situation worse and take worst case, take staff resource away from another area where it's already under pressure and worse, require us to have an additional resource at a time when our budgets are constrained, um, I, I can't support. Um, however, um, perhaps the option here is to uh, defer this to, to officers and ask them to come back with uh, an explanation and a, a, a clarity on what the true cost will be with this. But in the meantime, any parishioner can go online to a, a vast array of online petition sites and can use those to lobby this council. They can contact each of us individually if they so wish. But to create something new, simply just for the sake of it, it seems superfluous to me. So uh, on this, um, unless the decision and the discussion hereafter convinces me otherwise, uh, I'm afraid I can't support this recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Haywood. I noticed that Councillor Skinner um, from outside Cabinet has uh, put his hand up. I'm happy to hear from Councillor Skinner, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. And um, it, it is difficult sometimes when uh, uh, obviously you do outside and then inside and then something happens in the debate. And perhaps, so thank you for giving me the opportunity just to just to come back and I'll be as brief as I can. And I absolutely, uh, I heard absolutely what uh, Councillor Hayward was speaking about. Um, but what we have to be careful here on something that was as close to having its representation, but slightly short of its numbers, does not detract from the fact that lots of people had a view and they wanted to be heard. I do understand what Councillor Haywood has said that when you look at the, you look at the, uh, you can just get a petition up and get to doing whatever you want to do and talking about the different avenues of what can be done. But I think what we have to be careful of here is that we are a democratic process and that people have an opportunity to do things in the choice of which they wish to take them. And I understand absolutely what Councillor Haywood has said and, and make no mistake, we've been in the same position as when we were in power in, in the way that, um, 
you know, you have uh, uh, um, petitions uh, ch checking against what you're doing and the constraints can be quite difficult when there is cost implications. And you've pointed that out, Councillor Haywood, and I absolutely understand from what you were saying with that. But we must not let slip, in my belief, that whichever way people choose to engage in the democratic process, that we open that process up to them to the best way that we possibly can. And in some ways, when we talk about the fact that some numbers were quite short, short, and that there was a debate discussion, as we all know, regarding whether or not it should be allowed or not be allowed and all the rest of it. If, if a number of people come forward with a point of view, we need to be hearing what they have to say and take on board what they have to say in order, whichever context that is. That's my only caveat to what you were saying, Councillor Hayward. And lots of things that you said, I do agree with actually, in what you were saying. And I also understand because I'm a councillor. But what we've got to remember is, and you did point it out to be fair, but what we do have to remember is as councillors and as officers, that when people want to feel strongly about something, they don't necessarily know what the process is to get to some people. And they see a petition as a way forward of getting to that way. And I'm certainly not going to be one who wants to stymie any form of people approaching our authority with the points of view in the numbers of people in coming forward in whichever format they want to use. So I'm oh, very open-minded and we should be all ears open to what members of public have to say and whichever format they decide in which to take. And that is something I will always support. I will never ever support anything that is in any shape or form going to close down the democratic process. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Skinner. I suppose the thing we could reflect on is whether the nature of this particular uh, petition, petitions actually, the difficulties there were with it in terms of the, the wording and the phrasing uh, and whether they were uh, complete in the information they provided, um, is the federal case upon which this council should build a policy moving forward on on petitions. Um, however, that is that is uh, yet to be uh, determined. So, coming back into into cabinet, please, uh, Councillor Nick Hookway. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I too have concerns about this um, recommendation. I'm not quite sure why it just only states and refers to car parking. Surely there are petitions about other issues as well. Uh, the request to consider a landing page on the Council's website uh, is, I think, one that Councillor Hayward's already alluded to. It is incredibly difficult to do that. Other uh, service areas have spoken to me about this in the past, and the work involved, the expense of or particularly the strata is immense and uh, uh, as yet uh, we've not been able to do that i also do worry that having an, uh, another landing page might confuse people when they're coming onto our council website and not actually uh, and divert them from the information that they're perhaps genuinely trying to seek uh, the other issue i have with putting this sort of thing online is that it's wide open to fraudulent abuse and uh, I really do think that we need to think about something a little bit more uh, secure uh, and more uh, uh, rigid. So I'm afraid I can't support this, this recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hookway. And indeed, as I recall from the, without in any way asserting that there was fraudulent um, involvement in, in these particular petitions or that there was sort of, you know, M Mouse Disneyland Avenue signing, that there did seem to be some signatures there which didn't actually seem to belong on a local petition. Um, coming now, please, to Councillor Young. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, th this has got good intentions, but um, and uh, but I would um, um, I would like to see more meat on the bone before I can make a decision on this. Um, now, the consideration of staff time, uh, consideration of costs. Um, I would like to know how other councils manage it. Uh, and uh, I've got a, uh, a concern that we are going to be asked, we'll be running the, um, uh, the, the survey or the uh, petition. Uh, 
under our name and it it's about us so we're sort of the referee and uh, the player at the same time so I, I'm a bit dubious how it would work and if the result comes out in our favour um, people possibly could be saying um, oh um, no of course they've uh, they've decided that um, so there was a there's a lot of concerns here so um, at this moment in time I, I, I couldn't support this uh, but I wouldn't rule it out forever. Um, I would like, like to know a lot more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor York. Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is tricky, uh, simply because the principle behind it, I understand the intention behind it, it is a positive one. Of course, you want to encourage engagement and if we are not aware of the feelings of our residents then petitions are obviously a good way for that to become something that we are aware of um, but I'm very conscious at the same time um, about our resourcing and it strikes me that there are organisations out there whose sole brief is to provide a verified platform to undertake online petitions. And what we're effectively seeking to do is reinvent the wheel, which uh, as Councillor Young has alluded to, uh, could um, lead some people to believe that the petition isn't being handled um, correctly if the outcome is the way uh, that some believe wasn't the way they wanted it to go. Um, but also it means that if there are any faults or problems, we're creating a, a whole lot of work which might be unnecessary. For me, the important fact here is that the, the process, the policy and the guidance um, need to be readily available about how to structure that petition in the first place, no matter what platform it's undertaken on, whether that's a pre-existing online platform or whether that's um, a, a sheet of paper, um, or whatever. And those, those policies are available online. They, I found them very, very quickly by simply Googling East Devon petition, and it got straight through to uh, the, the policy on the East Devon District Council page. So the information is available. And of course, anyone seeking to undertake a petition could ask for advice. I think the issues that we've had have come about because of uh, the structure more so um, with, with multiple petitions running simultaneously and a breakdown of communication between those bodies that are undertaking those petitions. I appreciate that they may not have been aware that both were taking place, but again, that comes back to policy. And um, with all respect to our officers, uh, they try to assess that and make that as preferable to those putting forward the petition as possible so that those views would be um, considered if at all possible. So I don't think that having an online platform is necessarily going to resolve that problem. Um, I think it's just going to end up being a, an additional burden on our, our staff and our resources, but actually not generate the benefit that I think the, the proposal is actually seeking to achieve. Um, I'm not sure that I could support this the way it is, um, but equally, again, I'm open to hearing uh, an assessment of, of the um, what possible benefit that could actually provide, uh, rather than, and, and also what the implications are as well. I, I need a little bit more information about that to be able to, um, to understand if this is something that we really want to pursue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor uh, Jack Rowland, please. Thanks, Chair. Well, the recommendations is broken down into two parts. It says to consider a pl petition platform. It doesn't say to implement one, which in my mind, if we want to consider it, this means that we need a report coming back to Cabinet showing a lot more detail about the pros and cons and what other platforms might be available that could be of use in this arena. Because I do totally support um, what's been said before about the ability of the public to raise petitions. 
And the second part of the recommendation is to publicise the council's petition scheme. I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that. Was that actually saying the current petition scheme or if we introduce a new scheme, that that is then when it gets publicised? So I wasn't quite sure how to interpret the recommendations, but um, I'm in favour of some more work being done so that we can consider this in more detail. Um, so that's where I'm coming from on this particular recommendation, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Um, I, I share that view in part, and I hear what everybody has said, uh, and yet there's a sort of slightly um, hard-hearted uh, approach that I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to and other members of the Cabinet may not be, which is I do think that this came from scrutiny predicated on the idea that there had been something wrong with this council's response to the car parks um, petition. There was not, and that is a canard. So this recommendation comes, in my view, to Cabinet from, from not the best place uh, and with a kind of all, all from the hip uh, from from scrutiny is my view and it, it looks to me as if either we um, look to put it across to overview perhaps to see if they may wish to commission a report or at this stage we just say no that seems to be where where this this debate goes um, but councillor ledger please thanks very much chair um a lot of this work's already been done by our IT provider in Strata. They've created the same system uh, for this exact purpose for Exeter already. Um, I don't feel that we've had any conversation with them on the pitfalls, the amount of staff time that it would take up, um, or just generally scoping this out at all. Um, and so right now, uh, this evening, I wouldn't be able to support it, but... Uh, as Councillor Rowland said, we need to put a lot more meat on the bones. Uh, if we could get that, then things could be different. Is this a, a council priority that needs to be implemented in the next six months? Have we got more pressing priorities? I think we do. Um, so could I probably suggest that as a recommendation is that we um, have a scoping report come to us in the new year? Okay. Should it come to us, Councillor Ledger, or should it go to overview, I wonder? Um, overview is absolutely your... fine, Chair. They, they don't have anything on their, on their list at the moment, so I'm sure that they're, they're, they'd be more than glad to take it. Yeah, because I, I worry otherwise it, it looks like us sitting in judgment on ourselves, so to speak. Um, OK, now, Councillor Maddie Chapman... <laughs> You were on the scrutiny committee. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, but back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, no, no, I, 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 um, I just would like to um, get some clarity here um, and react to a couple of comments. Um, I know that there were a couple of um, the car parking petitions put out. Um, it wasn't a knee-jerk. Um, or anything like that. I think it was the point that a lot of um, residents felt that they wanted to put their views in. Um, and basically, as campers, we weren't listening. Um, so that's where that came from. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, hang on. We did an online consultation uh, for 106 and sell money in Exmouth. Um, and East Devon put out, this is what we've got. Um, what would you like us to do? Um, and they got the response from the public. Um, and everyone that signed it um, had to put their postcodes. So it wasn't people from outside the area. So people in the area found out where they wanted the money to go um, and what you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, in priority. Um, and I just think it's a shame. Um, and if we can do it for a consultation, um, why we can't word something and put something out when we know the public in an area 
or worried about something or other and they're thinking of getting up a petition, why we don't do a consultation and say, okay, you can sign on this and put your postcode in and tell us what you think, um, then they feel that we are actually listening. Um, and I think it's sad when we say, well, you know, actually, you know, we don't want to do this. Um, you know, we haven't got time to do this. Um, you know, I think it, it, the public will feel very sort of disappointed and let down. Um, and I think, you know, no matter what it is, I mean, we've got people in Exmouth at the moment absolutely furious with South West Water uh, for bringing in sewerage tanks into the mayor um, uh, and pumping sewerage tanks um, across half of East Devon, um, you know, to go into the mayor filtration plant. And everyone was saying, well, what are you doing? We've got enough here without you bringing it in. And I won't say the word, um, you know, so the public really need to have a platform where they can get together, put the views, um, and that gives us some guidance on what they're actually thinking. But that's just my view, Leader. Thank you. No, th no thank you, Councillor Chapman. Much, much valued. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to be disparaging of discussion at scrutiny at all. I'm just worried, you know, it's like um, sometimes, you, you, you know, bad law comes from exceptional cases, doesn't it? Um, and I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to put, ask our officers, I'm not going to put them on the spot tonight to, to rehearse what the problems were with those petitions. It, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Sometimes these things are so obvious, of course we could do that. And then you look at it for a minute and you think about it. And Councillor Jackson has already said, there are so many other platforms out there, um, which, you know, frankly, you know, younger people than most of us can access instantly to get a petition going. Um, Councillor Ledger has said that Strata have done some of the work looking at the technical aspect of this as well. The other point I think we need to consider is, is whether this is the royal road to populism, if we're not really careful. There's a difference, isn't there, between a genuine neighbourhood petition and somebody mounting an alternative political campaign uh, without any democratic mandate themselves. I can quite imagine uh, Mr Johnson being involved in any number of petitions in the, in the coming years. So it's a nuanced argument, isn't it? Which is one I have to say I'm tempted by what Councillor Ledger has suggested, that we, 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 it goes to overview and it's a matter for them for the new year, perhaps. But anyway, no, Councillor, I'm terribly sorry, I can see you there. Sorry, Chair. Over to you, please, Councillor. Oh, right. Thank you. I think uh, Jack Rowlands, Councillor Jack Rowlands, uh, hit it on the head. This is about asking you to consider a petition platform. We're ask, not asking you to set one up. We're asking you to look at it. And that was a very strong uh, concern that... Uh, we weren't engaging with the general public in petitions in the most efficient way. And one of the biggest problems was the workload that happened when um, Henry Gordon Lennox had to count all of the different um, postcodes and try and re resolve that situation. So it was simply not uh, uh, shooting from the hip issue. It was a reconsideration of our transition program to look at electronic means. The second thing is to publicize the council's present existing petition scheme. So I, I, I do hope that uh, this is seen not as some kind of combative uh, populist approach. It's, it's a way of identifying things that scrutiny thinks could be improved and that's its role. Thank you, Chair. I'm very grateful for that for that um, clarification, Councillor. All your points are taken. Uh, final uh, speaker on this is Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, the proposal uh, that 
Dan Legend's foot forward is a solid one. Um, I think I'd like to second that. I think the, the report that goes to overview needs to not only understand what's available and what the implications are from a, a resourcing perspective, but I think it would also be quite interesting to understand um, whether petitions are still being received by that authority through other platforms, um, as well as their in-house platform. Um, and the reason I say that is because, as mentioned before, there are, are a lot of other platforms already available that are, people very much know. You know, they're not um, unknown entities. You know, if I wanted to set up a petition myself, I could name five off the top of my head of ones where I've received petitions from other people about other matters. So, I, and I believe because they are geared up to do just that, there is a verification process for those that are filling those in. So I would expect that it's likely that those authorities are still receiving them uh, from third party uh, organisations as well. So it'd be good to just understand as part of that what um, uh, what the uptake is of the in-house solution, so to speak. Um, but yeah, again, I, I think Councillor Arnott's right. This has come about through not, not through residents not having the ability to put in a petition. They absolutely have, and they, and they have put those forward. Uh, it's more to do with how they've been structured, and perhaps there needs to be a, a, a route for advice when setting those up. But I, I don't know that people looking to set up a petition would even necessarily look at the East Devon website to find the in-house solution or the advice. Um, they'll simply set up a petition. Um, but thank you. So, I, but I would like to second what uh, Councillor Ledger's put forward. I think it's it's important that we at least look at this um, and give it some serious consideration. Thank you, Sir Councillor Jackson. Uh, Councillor Ledger, are are you just to remind us? Your proposal was to to send this across to overview to make further progress. Is that correct, or or to bring it back to cabinet? Yeah, to, I'm I'm happy for it to go to overview. Just push it into into the new year. I'm just very um, well. I can understand how much work the officers have got at the moment. I don't want to pile it off. I know how much we've got in the next six months. So I would say for the new year, please. Okay, Councillor Jackson, are you happy with that? Okay, and um, I hope Democratic Service Officers, that seems straight, do shout if that's not straightforward enough. Um, okay, well, uh, let's take that as a uh, uh, recommendation from us in relation to that. Uh, and Amanda, can you take us to a vote, please, now? Certainly. Councillors, if you can vote in the usual way, please. So that's seven votes in favour and one abstention, Chair. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Can we just try and pick up? I mean, that was a, a thank you scrutiny for bringing this forward. It's a, it, you can see it's a, it's a complex, nuanced uh, and important matter that has slightly eaten some time oh. at the meeting, which I apologise. Um, sure. the... sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, would, I did want to ask for clarification, which is why my virtual hand was raised to that the vote was being called then. Um, so it's been recorded as me abstaining. That wasn't my intention, actually. I did want to just ask for clarification on what we were voting for, whether it's both parts of that recommendation, because um, there are two parts to it. I think my understanding is that both parts are covered by the recommendation because it would be a matter for overview to look at how it was then further publicised. But I think Councillor Jackson has, and I think Councillor Ledger has said, well, you can sit there, Google East Devon Council petitions, and you go, you go smack straight to the site at the moment. Okay. Well, for the purposes of the record, can I have my vote recorded as being in favour and not abstaining them, please? Okay. So if we, we can just amend that to a um, uh, unanimous, please. Um, not that we record that anyway, do we particularly? So, but thank you. Uh, it wasn't a recorded vote. Um, can we see if we can just, I know I said we'll break at 7.30. Let's just see if we can make some substantial progress over the next 10 minutes. Um, we've got now agenda item 10, which is the minutes of the Housing Review Board held on the 16th of June. 
Uh, we have a number of recommendations there, uh, which you can find on page 71 of your agenda. Um, now, would anybody like to speak to those, please? Or are we happy to accept those recommendations as they come? That I'm, I'm happy to, to propose them or second them, Chair. They all, they all seem sound and, and the minutes seem very, very clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Haywood. So we can just agree to move that forward without any further specific recommendations. Councillor Roan, possibly you were going to second that, were you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because I, I, I don't Sorry, feel this, we need. This is HRBs, uh, so if we can take a vote, please. Thank you, Henry. Okay, yeah. Amanda, can we vote, please? Certainly. Councillors? That's seven votes in favour, Chair. Thank you very much again. Now, agenda item 11. Uh, again, you can find it on page 80 of the agenda. Uh, and there are a number of recommendations there in relation to minute six, the asset management plan for general fund assets. Minute seven, the land to the south of Redgate, Salterton Road, Exmouth. And minute eight, the update on community asset transfer procedure. Uh, would anybody like to speak to any of those? Councillor Haywood, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, on Paul, this Paul, can I, before you start, um, Hen Henry's put his hand up. So can I go to Henry first, please? Sorry, I wasn't looking to, to interject. I, was, I could do this later on, but um, I was just going to ask for a slight tweak in, in relation to minute seven, please. So it, yeah. it talks about delegated authority to three officers. You only need it, you only need it to what? Well, in fact, you can only have it to one officer. So I was just going to suggest a slight tweak to A and B which is to move strategic lead governance and licensing and strategic lead finance to in, in the in, in consultation part. So it's just a sort of slight tweak to, to reflect that. But the delegation, okay. the service lead place assets and commercialization in consultation with portfolio holder for economy and assets and strategic leads governance and licensing and finance. Understood. Thank you, Henry, very Thanks. much. Sorry, Councillor Hey, we're back to you, please. No, no problem at all. Thank you, Henry, for that clarification. Thanks. Um, it's really just another one where, because I, I named within this and I chaired this, I don't feel, um, you know, comfortable proposing or seconding. I certainly support and endorse everything in here. Um, and thank you again to Tim and his team for a huge amount of work. Our current AMP is out of date. Um, it's not obsolete, but it's out of date and it needs tweaking. And Tim and his team have put a lot of work forward to bring it forwards to the Asset Management Forum. We considered it. And we, we now recommend to the cabinet. Um, so that's items a uh, minute six. Minute seven. Uh, well, for those members who've read this report and for those of AMF who sat through it, this is one of these ones. It's almost like a gift horse in the mouth. You know, we're being given uh, a piece of land and essentially um, to build at nil consideration the thing. And then we just have to kid it out. It, it seems almost too good to be true. But the recommendation is before you um, A to D. Um, and then item uh, eight, which is the community asset transfer, where we know how long this has been in the pipeline. Um, it's, it's come, it's gone. Henry has tweaked some wording, very welcome. And now it's come back. So uh, all I can say, Chair, is thank you to everyone involved in this, uh, officers and members alike. I'm more than happy to endorse this, but if other members of cabinet are happy to pose a second, um, I welcome them. Thank you very much, Chair. It's a, it's a great forward step for us all. Yeah, and thank you, Councillor Haywood, as portfolio holder for this and all the work you've been doing with Tim and his team on this. Councillor Rowland, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I formally move um, the three recommendations that are on the agenda paper? Thank you very much, Councillor Young. Uh, and can I second it, please? Thank you. Amanda, can we go to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, Henry, this is a little bit kind of the next one, agenda item 12, 
is a slightly odd one, isn't it? I mean, one would like to just whip through it and, and uh, agree to all of this, but it comes ahead of cult- uh, item 15, the culture strategy and action plan. Um, I'm just looking at what we're being asked to agree to there. I mean, we're, we're being asked, for example, to endorse the cultural strategy plan, but we're going to be debating it in a few items time. I wonder what the best way of doing that is. Uh, so I think you've got a slight, a slight different, a slight difficulty in the sense of minute sevens after, after a particular resourcing, isn't it? Um, yeah. So I think the, uh, you would you would normally just take them into account at the point at which you're considering the matter on the agenda. So as long as we remember to come back to them and, and have okay. regard to take your final decision. Thank you. Um, if you can write that on the back of your hand, please, Henry, I'd be very grateful. So, OK, that's lovely. So in which case, then, may I suggest, and I know it's slightly uh, early, um, but let's just take a breather for five minutes, um, seven minutes, if we can reconvene at 7.45 on the dot, please. And please go and have drink lots of fluids. Thank you.
I'm back, Amanda. Okay, Chair, we're still streaming, so you can carry on with the meeting now if you wish. Thank you very much indeed. You can see, I, yes, I'm going to give it another 30 seconds. A few people leaping into their seats still. Um, okay, thank you, everybody. Hope you had a refreshing break. Uh, let's now come to agenda item 13. Uh, the Leisure and Built Facilities Strategy 2021 to 2031. Uh, and we have a report here from Charlie Plowden, the Service Lead for Countryside and Leisure. Over to you, please, Charlie. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to try and pop a slide on everyone's screen to put the uh, strategy. I tend to put the strategy on a page. So, as they say, bear with whilst I do that. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can. That's good, Charlie. Thank you. See that? We good? Lovely. Okay. Um, just to go through, it, I mean, I'm conscious uh, members have have had quite a lot of documentation to to wade through. So, hence, trying to summarise it very, very briefly. Um, start off with a reminder for members that the process we followed in developing the strategy is in accordance with Sport England's guidance. That's really important as it enables us to work with their national policy framework and also submit uh, potential future funding bids. There are five high level strategic priorities that I think Cabinet needs to um, consider with the, uh, the leisure strategy. Firstly, we have a, an aging facility stock. Many were built over 30 years ago now and we know that there will need to be a considerable investment uh, in those facilities in the lifetime of this strategy. So key decisions about our capital investment programme into the facilities will need to be made. Uh, also discussions about our future relationship with our dual use sites will be critical. Safe, safeguarding issues uh, have reduced access levels for community use over the years, so we need to explore how we can continue to provide reasonable levels of community use despite these constraints. Um, the strategy has clearly identified that new leisure facilities are needed, uh, specifically in Cranbrook. How these will be funded, again, will require very careful consideration by members. There are also great gaps in many sports facilities across the district, mainly in swimming pools, uh, squash courts and netball courts. Again, we'll need to consider very carefully how we provide and fund these going forward, as well as, as, well as continuing to invest in our existing facilities. Secondly, our alignment to our health and well-being priorities will be essential, as I think most um, members will have seen from the recent consensus uh, report that came out that uh, has shown East Devon has the greatest, greatest percentage increase in population of all the Devon local authorities and more than double the national average. We had the highest proportion of 90 plus year olds of any local authority in England and Wales, and also significant growth in under 10s. These issues are going to present us with unique, with unique challenges uh, to meet in terms of providing adequate leisure support in areas such as areas as GP referral schemes. Thirdly, to look at delivering that second priority, we'll need to develop new partnerships to deliver, to deliver leisure and support activities. Uh, we'll need to work with organisations such as Active Devon and the Cranbrook Local Delivery Pilot to unlock other sources of funding to support the delivery of the strategy's action plan. Fourthly, it's clear we need to continue to better utilise the outdoors and our natural environment to deliver physical health benefits. Our footpaths, cycleways, green spaces, nature reserves, etc., can all play a part if we scale up the outreach work so it reaches all our communities, particularly in rural areas. This can help deliver leisure in a different and more cost-effective way. And these assets alongside our leisure centres can play an important part in meeting the growing demands and also expand, expand accessibility to activities and provide a more affordable model for those who struggle to pay for an annual LED membership. And finally, all these tie into our review of LED's management contract as the next 10 years will see changes as identified above. So the contract has to be fit for purpose. 
what's important to stress is that the strategy is not looking to reduce our leisure provision in terms of accessibility to leisure activities, rather sustain and grow it to meet these increasing demands. And that is what I wanted to say on the strategy. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, a bit tongue-tied there. It's very warm in this room um, at Blackdown House. <laughs> Have you ground to all? Fuddled. No. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> I was hoping to get it before the comfort break. Can you? <laughs> yeah. I'll Can just you, um... remove, yes, that. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's very Next, good. Yeah. You poor man. Yeah, I was in Blackdown House earlier today and it was it was a bit yeah, toasty. Yeah, I think I'm in the room where um the air conditioning isn't working, so it feels no. pretty warm. <laughs> oh, that's the sauna facility that's <laughs> yeah. offered free to employees. Yeah. Right, okay. So let's have a look and see who would like to speak on this subject. Uh Councillor Nick Hookway, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a moment to unmute. Yes, um, this uh, leisure and built facilities strategy is a major step forward for this, this administration in dealing with the provision and management of leisure. Initially, the leisure strategy was a response to the financial crisis caused by the COVID pandemic. Members may remember that. And the Council's need to manage the leisure budget with our service provider, LED. However, as the work of this, on the strategy progressed, it became apparent that a range of issues around the provision of leisure uh, required attention. The strategy has identified those issues that we will need to address over the next 10 years and recommended appropriate action. Uh, these issues range from the operational costs that we occur on a yearly basis to the long-term planning for the new provision of and replacement of ageing facilities. A key aspect of having the strategy in place is that we will now be able to bid for national funding bodies for financial support in developing our facilities. Indeed, the process of funding has already been discussed on the agenda in terms of the Shared Prosperity Fund. Critically, therefore, this strategy will allow us to provide leisure facilities in a managed and prudent fashion. As a final point, I must say that the last two years have proved to be challenging, to say the least, in the provision of our leisure facilities. And I would like to place on record my thanks to those members, officers, the board and staff of LED and our consultant Strategic Leisure for their hard work and allowing this council to keep its leisure facilities open in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hookway. I'm coming back from outside Cabinet, Councillor Jake Vanessa, please. Thank you, Leader, and apologies that uh, I'm unable to turn my camera on at this uh, very point in time. Um, I just uh, wanted to comment on this uh, very quickly, uh, but first and foremost, I think a massive thank you must go to every single person that's been involved with this project inside the Council uh, and also with our consultants. I think this is an absolute brilliant piece of work. And as uh, Councillor Hookway has just mentioned, it also provides a legal framework which will allow us to accept more funding which is absolutely brilliant news for our towns and villages across the district. I think this is also very exciting for the sports groups across uh, East Devon uh, in developing the deal and the offer that we can provide them. And as you have also, uh, as uh, Councillor Hookway has also just mentioned, in terms of a post-COVID recovery in leisure across the district, I think that is going to be so important, especially moving into the 2030s. So I just want to put a massive thank you out there to Charlie, Nick, um, and of course, uh, everyone else involved. I just had um, one, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of things uh, very quickly, if I may. I'm just looking at the action plan associated with the ledger strategy. Um, in terms of the key actions, I'm looking at uh, actions 1A and 1D specifically um, in terms of uh, the Honiton uh, artificial turf pitch um, it says here that uh, we are at an expected time scale for uh, the priority location of an ATP in Honiton is to be completed by 2024 a site appraisal that that being um, I just wanted to uh, also uh, find out whether there were any time scales allocated in the action plan or under 1a as to whether um, that work will actually go ahead uh, and how much East Devon will obviously put into it and how much work they will uh, be able to put into it. The second point I wanted to um, 
sort of feed into this. Um, it is slightly different, and uh, I do apologise if this is more of a playing pitch strategy uh, question. However, I do think it is important to mention um, Honiston Youth Football Club, um, who obviously do uh, uh, are currently resident um, at Mountbatten Park and St Rita's um, Centre in Honiston. I know there have been some ongoing negotiations with East Devon around that, and obviously I won't go into that in public session here. Um, however, I just wanted to um, ascertain from from po the portfolio holder or from any officers um, what uh, what uh, their their sort of situation would be able to gain out of this uh, report, and whether whether um, any mention of uh, facilities uh, and or especially built facilities like a clubhouse, for example, for them. Uh, could be popped into this report. Uh, once again, my thanks uh, go to everyone involved. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bonetta. I might just um, see if Charlie is able to answer either of those uh, questions, but notwithstanding that, um, perhaps written answers can be given. But just to say before that, that it was a real pleasure to be at the Honiston Swimming Pool today uh, with the portfolio holder, Councillor Hookway, um, with the Deputy Leader of the Council, Councillor Haywood, and a number of our officers where the new changing rooms were, um, were unveiled. Um, in fact, to my embarrassment, I, I cut a red ribbon there. Um, so there we go, first, possibly last time. But uh, I was delighted. It, it, it really showed what an amazing effort LED have made through the pandemic against the odds to, to increase uh, the facilities, not just let them sort of wither on the vine. Um, and um, so hopefully the people of Honiton will, will, will benefit hugely from that. And um, I commend it to you, Councillor Bonetta. Um, to get down there for a splash. Anyway, um, Councillor Submit, Charlie Plowman, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, if I get in reverse order to Jake's questions, I know regarding the youth football uh, pitch provision issue there, that's been picked up by Tim Child's team, and I know Rob Murray's been in discussion with um, some readers, and also there was a meeting recently, an internal meeting involving some of the ward members, just to talk about how to progress their race sort of specific issues. So it may be, Chair, um, that's a discussion I can pick up with, um, with Jake outside of this meeting and um, update him if necessary. I, but I know that Tim, Tim Child was going to uh, contact all the relevant ward members about um, the sort of planned um, uh, progress with that. So that's on that. Regarding um, the uh, ATP, the all weather pitch um, at uh, Honiton, yeah, I think that is a playing pitch strategy issue that's been picked up again by planning policy. Again, it's been an identified need for some time now, and the school being very articulate in, in um, uh, presenting their sort of specific needs and demands. So um, again, might be worth us just picking that one up outside of the meeting just to sort of follow through with Jake, if that's okay. Yeah, Might yes. I just at that point, um, and I'm grateful for Charlie for clarifying that. Yes, uh, quite a few of these aspects that uh, Councillor Bonetta raised were discussed at a ward member portfolio holder officer session recently. Um, but as, as Jake has alluded to, it, it, it is a third party, you know, commercially sensitive lease discussion. So it's certainly not appropriate to discuss it in an open meeting, um, but I'm more than happy to take it up with uh, Councillor Bonetta and with uh, Tim and Rob Harrison, uh, the other officer who's, draw who's giving advice and pushing this forward in his professional role. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got four speakers left. Um, if I can encourage you all to come in at 90 seconds or so, if, if, if at all possible, just so we can continue to make uh, progress. Uh, but, but don't feel so repressed by that. If you want to go longer, please do. Uh, Councillor Steve Gazard, Steve, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be really brief. I just wanted to say that um, this is a very, very important strategy for all the residents of East Devon. And um, as we come out of the pandemic, we, we do need a strategy for the well-being of all our, our residents and of all ages. And I think this, this suits the bill. And I hope Cabinet will endorse it. Thank you, Councillor Gazard, um, both for the sentiment and the brevity. Councillor Skinner, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And um, <clears throat> I'll try and be, be as brief as I can. Um, 
leisure facilities are absolutely vital for 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 people in in being able to access uh, our, our facilities and for us to play our part in that as a local authority is really fundamentally important. So the report that's come forward, I'm I'm really pleased with and and very much very much support. But what we what we must also make sure, of course, is that um, as we go forward with with our strategy and working with LED, and we know how expensive it is to provide leisure facilities, but I think that's part of our role, we must ensure that it encompasses being available to all. And there were some questions raised previously um, regarding the equalities report and where we were with equalities. And I'll ask Charlie if he can put some more meat on the bone to that, just to make sure that our facilities, and I, I don't expect us to be able to absolutely transform all of our facilities from being in one place today to another place tomorrow in, in, in being able to pull in all of the uh, um, um, people in whichever, however, the capacity of which they can engage with sport and with our facilities in general. But to know that we've got a treading a path that is treading towards ensuring that all people across the spectrum, across all sorts of equalities, can, and that our strategy is working towards that goal, because that must be the tr strategy that we want to go forward. And then to ensure that our equalities report is really up to place, up to standard, and taking us forward. And, and it, it is very inclusive, or as inclusive as it possibly can, in the way of engaging with, with people from all sectors of life and with all sorts of issues of which they may have either mental or physical attributions, and how we're going forward with that. Is that something you could touch on for me, please, Charlie? Okay, Three. can I just, um, just, you, just very, very briefly, of course, we... We had an answer on that to Mr. Goodman earlier about the equalities assessments that go on in relation to this. But notwithstanding that, I'm sure we can come to Charlie in a second. Just like to say, in 10 seconds, anecdotally, for having been to Holland and Paul today, uh, the facilities there for people with disabilities are absolutely astounding. The improvements to the uh, disability area, dressing rooms, the ways in which the pool can be accessed um, are magnificent. But I, I take the point we need to hit that standard. Always don't move you forward. Um, really good. Charlie, do you want to say something about uh, how equalities are, are considered when we when we uh, when we um, uh, move ahead with things like this? Yeah, I just pick up on the point um, with uh, Councillor Skinner. Thanks for that, Phil. And, and I don't disagree with anything that you said. And I hoped I'd sort of reassured uh, Mr. Goodman with the correspondence that we had on this issue that the strategy um, that's been uh, presented to to Cabinet tonight is very high level. Um, but what the Equalities Impact Assessment did do was picked up that there were um, very specific needs that need to be looked at with our sites, particularly I think one of the actions of disability audit of all our sites that was picked up as part of the consultation with the, um, with the groups that uh, were consulted. And through the uh, LED monitoring forum, that seemed to be the really appropriate um, uh, meeting to to consider this in, in, in more detail and pick it up and make sure that LED, obviously as our provider, leisure provider, are picking up these very, very important issues that you picked up, Phil. So um, it, that has been passed on. I've been uh, in discussion with their uh, LED's operations director to uh, make him aware this has been picked up and that we must follow through. So just to give you reassurance there, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks both for that. Um, DSOs, can I just very briefly ask one of you, I've just had a, a text coming through from somebody interested in a later item to say that there's no sound on for the cabinet meeting via Zoom and YouTube. So that may or may not be a correct report. I just wonder if somebody could have a uh, listen and see if we are with sound on YouTube or whether we're doing a mime act today. Um, notwithstanding that, let's press on. Uh, Councillor Jeff Young, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the key statement in all of this is um, get hold of um, uh, more funding streams. Um, that, that's the key to all, um, all of this, isn't it? Um, I, I like uh, that we're also including using the outdoors, uh, using our footpaths, parks, um, open areas, beaches, and not forgetting my favourite, cycleways. So, um, now, we, we need funding for all of that, um, and we w want people to enjoy our wonderful countryside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. 
Uh, Councillor Dan Ledger, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, very quick question for, for Charlie. Um, it's kind of been a bit grey on who, who is actually in charge of this uh, in previous years. Um, especially, I, I'm looking at from uh, looking into the, the ledger strategy, how it feeds into the playing pitch strategy uh, and the other strategies. So with, for instance, the playing pitch strategy, the planning policy creates it, then it's down to either yourself or Tim's team. So with those kind of, well, clear lines of communication, is it going to be your team fully implementing this uh, and then delegating to Tim's team as necessary? It was just a little bit of clarity on how it's going to work and how the actual implementation is going to be formed, basically, if possible. Thanks, Councillor Ledger. Charlie, can you help us with that? Will do, Chair. Yeah, just on that, Dan, we had quite a good discussion, I think, at the last LED monitoring forum about the role of the, the monitoring forum effectively sort of transitioning into almost like a scrutiny role over the strategy and the action plan. And the, what, the great thing about the current forum setup is that we have representatives of all the, um, the key services um, to be able to prioritise uh, the actions and to assess where we're at with them. So I would see the forum has a key role in driving that and directing officers as to where the priorities are. Because you're right, there are multiple services um, who are involved with delivering the strategy, which is going to be you know, the same with the culture strategy as well, which I was going to sort of um, pick up sort of later on um, this evening. So um, I see it's a combination, um, Dan, if I'm honest, of um, working with Tim. Obviously, Simon, he's been very quiet through this whole um, uh, report, but he has, you know, a hugely important role um, to play in terms of, you know, setting the financial sort of framework for, you know, how we can um, progress some of the actions as well. So um, I'm not sure if that really answers you, but I see the... The governance structure is very much through the LED monitoring forum, directing officers, you know, on terms in terms of priorities and and um, actions. Very much, Charlie. Chair, with Thank that, you. I just propose. Yes. I don't think you've had a proposal yet, so I'll propose yep. the recommendations listed in the report, please. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd just like to also, just before I look for a second. Uh, uh thank the chair and vice chair of the led monitoring forum for the work that they've put into this over a long period of time um we were delighted as an administration to identify that we thought it would be helpful to have a specific led monitoring forum and although i'm sure that must have been something that was you know challenging uh, initially um for led I think it's been a, a brilliant forum and you know, a great deal of understanding has, has come through that. Um, and I think two of our younger councillors, uh, Councillor Sam Hawkins in the chair and Councillor Paul Miller as vice chair um, through various periods of time, frankly led us towards the, the um, sportsing, sports strategy, strategy documents that we've, that, we've, that we've been able to discuss today. So it's been, it's been great teamwork by members of the council, cross party, great contribution from all parties on it. And thank you for that. Um, I would regard this as a, an historic moment where what this council is able to do is come out of a desperate situation um, with a real fighting chance, not only of maintaining what we have as much as we can, but to uh, implement a new vision going forward over 10 years. And I think that's the key thing to remember. This is over 10 years. So nobody should expect, you know, a new swimming pool in their back garden, you know, by Easter next year. It's not that type of thing. This, gu this guides the work of the council moving forward. Councillor Jack Rowland, please. That is a second, Chair. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, everybody, for your contributions on that. Uh, Amanda, can we go to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you can vote in the usual way, please. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much, Amanda. Agenda item 14 now, the Revenue and Capital Outturn Report 2021 to 2022. And we have a report here from our finance manager, John Symes. Over to you, please, John. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, so the report covers um, the outturn position to 31st of March 22. Uh, it covers general fund, the housing revenue accounts and the capital programme. Um, I will just cover the uh, main points um, coming from the report. Um, there's an increased number of appendices to the report this time, providing um, more detail on service area outturns. Uh, there's a list of earmarked reserves there, and also uh, detail of the housing revenue account outturn. Um, so I'm happy to take questions on those. Uh, the report itself uh, details that we undertook a review of the general fund adopted range. Um, so the report is proposing an increase to that of half a million pounds to 4.3 million pounds. Uh, the summary 2.12 in the report highlights the movement in the general fund. Um, it's quite a good summary um, that highlights um, that we've included transfers of 1.183 million to the transformation reserve. Um, and it also shows the proposed transfer of half a million pounds for the funding of the housing task force um, as previously reported to members. Um, section four of the report um, covers the housing revenue account. This shows a favourable outturn of 2.192 million um, and also details the proposed reserve allocations from that. Uh, the final section, which is at section five, uh, covers capital expenditure, where we've seen fully funded net capital expenditure in the year of 8.251 million. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed for that, John. Uh, can I look to see if there are anybody... Uh, Councillor Brewster Sarum, please. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I put a caveat, apologies, if, it, if, if it's being covered in another area of the report. Um, does, does the budget that we've just... Or the, the budget lines that you put forward, does it cover the um, how, review and update of the housing stock? Um, as we're aware, members are aware, there is a, a, the ongoing climate emergency. And I think one of Councillor Armstrong's previous actions was going to be to look at the housing stock and obviously where possible, uh, improve it and update it uh, so that it is as, is as carbon neutral as is possible. Obviously, this wasn't going to be something that could be achieved overnight, but I just wonder whether any of the budget lines will show this. And secondly, I know that Queen's Drive has been allocated to placemaking, but I wonder under economy and regeneration, whether any budget has been set aside to specifically make improvements to Queen's Drive um, as and when they're required. So those are my questions. And I do offer my sincere apologies if, they are to be if the answers are to be found in another part of the report, which I missed. Thank you, Chair. So those are quite high level questions, aren't they? Um, I don't know. Simon, John, who would like to respond to those at this stage? John, are you are up for that? Yeah, in terms of um, stock uh, condition surveys, um, the sec the area section of the report covering the HRA sort of goes into some detail there of um, reserves that have been put away. So um, within there, there's a million pounds being put away into the uh, plan maintenance reserve. Um, so that is what we'll be covering. Uh, stock condition. Um, in terms of Queen's Drive, I don't think there's anything in particular in the report covering that. Okay, thank you very much, John. Yeah, just, just to help as well, under 4.4, under the Capital Development Fund, that's to do with um, uh, a reserve for, for our climate change development. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Ledger. Um, I'm not sure I would have expected anything to be in this year's account regarding Queen's Drive in any case, as we're still at... Simon, you're looking ready to pounce here. Thank you, Chair. That's very helpful. Um, so to help um, Councillor ask the question, this is to do with the outturn for last year. Um, I think the question really relates to what's happening this year in terms of... Um, budgets available to carry out work. So there is money set aside in the current year budget for Exmouth uh, work, Queen's Drive, which has now been extended to the whole of Exmouth in terms of um, council of approved budget for two years for a specific officer, if you remember, and you'll know um, Jerry in terms of the work he's been doing, but also additional sums in terms of consultation work that we're carrying out in order to bring forward reports to cabinet and council so there is certainly money in there for that development work for this year 
and there is specific money, as has been mentioned, for decarbonisation of um, the housing stock for this year as well. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, John, for those answers. That's very helpful and Councillor Ledger as well. Um, Councillor Tessarum, would you like to come back on any of that? or are you, are you... No, I think that's an extremely comprehensive reply, Chair, and I, I must thank the officers for their time in bringing, in bringing this to me. Thank you very much, Chair. Also, I would request if we could have reg more regular briefings with the portfolio holder that we used to have, um, where we could ask these questions as a cross-party. I haven't been invited to one recently. I don't know if we've missed it, but there, were, there used to be sort of cross-party budget discussions when Simon would give a presentation uh, and we could all ask. So I wonder if that's something that the, the finance portfolio could, could look into uh, uh, resuming. Thank you, Jack. I, I can't help but feeling he might have something to say about that, and he's the next yellow hand up. So, Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Yeah, well, I had my hand raised before uh, Councillor Desai, yeah. but I'm quite happy to answer that. Yeah. Yes, I'm more than happy to, um, I wouldn't say resume, I'd say continue, um, because uh, I'm very keen to continue those as the portfolio holder, because, uh, as you said, they are cross-party. Um, and that's despite some opposition, uh, Councillor Tassarum, from your party about taking part in those, if I recall correctly, when I tried to set them up. Um, so, yes, I'm more than happy to do that. And the appropriate time, I believe, is when we get round, and it always comes up very quickly, doesn't it, every year, at the start of the budget planning process for, for, the, next, for the next financial year. So that would be the appropriate time when I will be holding that one. Um, the reason I raised my hand as well is to um, give a huge thanks to uh, Simon, John Symes and the rest of the finance team because I was pleasantly surprised when I saw the end of year financial situation. Um, it's much better than I expected it to be. And um, I think I'm wearing my prudent hat when I think it's in the current climate with inflation and some of the challenges that are going to be coming down the line to move uh, that half a million pound to boost the general reserve fund and also to boost up the transformation fund and we've already seen um, from reports on the leisure and culture strategy that we're going to be talking about as well about the um, request to use that transformation fund to fund some additional posts so I'm glad that we've, we've got the opportunity to do that. And um, I'd like to move the, uh, the two recommendations that are on the agenda paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments, Councillor Rowland, and for all your own work on this this year. I, I am aware that you were very keen to be doing these, uh, continue with these cross-party forums. So I'm taking it from Councillor De Serum that he will be happy to uh, accept I've, I've been, been, and I've been, as you know, Chair, to many uh, cross-party forums. I haven't got a problem with cross-party forums. Um, and obviously, I, I, obviously, I'm a Conservative, naturally, but I'm happy to join in with any, any, any groups that uh, are for, for, for the benefit of our residents. Because I remember, we're always working for the benefit of our residents. And thank you, thank you so much indeed, Chair. Absolutely. Uh, and perhaps you can bring in some anecdotes from uh, Devon County Council as well, their own financial um, predicament, and see whether... Well, perhaps we can help them. You never know. So, right, uh, we have a proposer from Councillor Rowan. Can we have a second for that? Oh, no, Councillor Skinner, I'm terribly sorry. And Councillor Young, I can see you. There's and and just, just, just very quickly on that, uh, um, Chair, uh, I shall be ensuring that we are engaging with Councillor Rowland and the team in working cross-party. It is, makes absolutely no sense to be not working cross-party when the budget that uh, comes in the eight turn. And, uh, and I think we will be engaging that process. So if you want to get in contact with whatever, whichever way you want to do that, that's fine. And I will ensure that that's how we work. Thank you. That's really welcome, Councillor Skinner, the new, the new broom. Uh, Councillor Jeff Young, please. I'd like to uh, second the proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Amanda, can you take us to a vote on this, please? Certainly, Chair. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks, John, again uh, for that. Uh, we now come back to agenda item 15, uh, another really exciting item tonight um, with Charlie Plowden, uh, and it's the Culture, Culture Strategy and Action Plan for East Devon. 
2022 to 2031. Over to you, please, Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Uh, one more slide for me, sorry. If I can just get that up on the screen. Okay. Has that come up on your screen? It has, Charlie. Lovely. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with a report that's uh, literally just been produced by Creative England this month. Um, and my thanks go to Andy Wood, who, um, who gave me sight of it. And it stated some very important um, conclusions which are relevant to the culture strategy. Um, first up, the economic benefits of culture are now clearly understood nationally. Uh, for the Southwest in 2015, 8.6% of all jobs were in the creative economy. And since 2015, there's been a 32.5% increase in job creation in this sector, one of the fastest in the UK. The report has shown the number of nationally significant clusters in the creative sector, and it highlights the area focused around Exeter's travel to work area as one of the top 10% of creative clusters in the UK. And this cluster ranked among one of the top areas in the UK in all key creative industries, including film, radio and TV, software and digital, music and performing arts, advertising, design, publishing and architecture. The report also identifies this creative cluster as having a very strong but dispersed creative and arts sector with a burgeoning creative arts and cultural scene in many marketing coastal towns where the stunning natural environment acts as a springboard to creativity. And finally, the report states the creative sector has a significant potential to add to high productivity growth in the area, helping to level up historic low pro productivity levels across the sector. So why is this report important for the Council on the Cultural Strategy? Um, I think it's clear that a strong and, and cohesive cultural offer in the district can and will enable considerable economic benefits in a wide sector of creative industries, helping to create job growth, drawing in visitor spend into the local economy, and helping sustain the creative, artistic and cultural communities in the district. And this has already started with a cultural programme bid submitted as part of the UK Single Prosperity Fund um, that supports our unique, creative artistic, our unique creative artistic communities. And also we're part of a Southwest LEP bid for £1.27 million from the DCMS Creative Growth Fund to help support emerging creative industries. And both of these funding submissions were strengthened by the culture strategy presented to you tonight as the evidence base supporting our bids. And we've been working very closely with our economic development team, obviously with Andy, uh, Rob and Tim, to realise these, um, these opportunities. Sorry, that's Tom. Um, the 10-year strategy is also about building trust across East Devon's cultural sectors through new partnerships and fostering local ownership. And the strategy recognises the cultural ecology and makeup of East Devon is very much around a distinctive, eclectic and grassroots based cultural activity uh, programme, as well as all the organisations that make up our USP, which the Creative England uh, report recognises. So we have five themes within the strategy which encompass what the strategy wants to achieve and three themes relating to how it will deliver which leads me on to the issue about resourcing the strategy, the ability for us to leverage in these funding programmes, be it the DCMS's Cultural Recovery Fund, Arts Council Strategic Portfolio of Funding Schemes or the Future Leveling Up programme, depends on our ability to be able to put forward detailed bid proposals that sit within the Culture Strategies Action Plan. That is my summary of the Culture Strategy Chair. Thank you, Charlie, very much. That was yeah. as elegant as a haiku. And I'm <laughs> sure we all understand, all understand that. that was, that's a um, thrilling uh, report. Thank you very much. Now, we are blessed this evening to be uh, in the presence of our uh, Arts and Culture Forum Supremo, Councillor Joe Whibley, who, mouth, mouth, <laughs> off you go, please, Joe. Thank you very much. Well, I'll invite you to uh, cut your second ribbon of the day on this beautiful strategy in a minute. Um, I'll read this as to, to, to keep it as haiku-like as possible. Um, just say it has been a really, really long, well-thought-out consultation. Um, it lays out a framework where we can build our offering into something which will 
um, bring people to the area and hopefully all year round as well, rather than just the summer. Um, and it was conceived before the current economic situation was developed, but I believe it's kind of more relevant now. Um, some of the benefits of arts and culture on things like mental health and um, you know creativity is 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 a marvelous thing for that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I think mental health will be one of the things that suffers most during um, the coming months. Um, and as Charlie said, um, this does have a cost. Uh, it is a relatively small one, um, and there's various funds. Uh, are set aside to cover it um, but in commending the strategy to the cabinet I'd like to remind them of the volume of work that Ruth and Charlie and their teams do um, have you seen Charlie tonight he's had two of these reports today um, huge huge amounts of work um, and, and that's ongoing and I think another team member especially for Ruth will free them up to uh, focus on, on what their role actually is um, because I think it's unfair to expect them to perform miracles um, ad infinitum. Um, I, and, and this is the perfect example of speculating to accumulate. I think that the, the um, uh, I can't remember who it was, the, the report which Charlie, was it the Arts Council? Um, re report which Charlie highlighted, which I haven't seen. Um, it's a perfect example, uh, the perfect um, uh, demonstration of the fact that um, you spend a little and potentially, you know, the, the, the rewards are huge. Um, so I kind of request the cabinet cut the red ribbon on this uh, on this um, strategy. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Councillor Whibley. You're making me feel very old. In fact, I wonder if anybody apart from me remembers an Arts Council report from 1983 called The Glory of the Garden. Does anybody remember that? No, yes, I remember as a six-year-old reading that. It was great. Yeah, you did, you did. You lined your cot with it. But um, so that that was the garden. That's us, that is. That's the area outside of London. And if that's nurtured properly through Arts Council funding, what a general you know benefit that will have. I have to say the bloke who wrote it then went off and set up uh, Pizza Express. So um, he, he had a mixed CV in my view. But anyway, right. So fantastic. Um, all sorts of people coming forward. Uh, Councillor Philip Skinner, please. Thank you. And uh, I think my uh, opening opening gambit is, is going to be to um, Charlie in, in talking about the culture strategy. It, look, it looks, looks really good. Um, it says lots of things which... I think we already knew, and it's a, it seems to me like how we're going to get into a funding stream. But what I'd like Charlie to do for me is explain to me what culture is. Because it seems a very, very wide remit, culture. I know what culture is, in my opinion, but is my opinion the view of what everybody else's opinion is? Because I just asked Charlie what he thinks um, and Charlie, sorry, I'm not trying to just put you on the spot. I'm just trying to get a general view of what people's view of what culture is. Arts is easy. You know what arts is. Culture is a different bag altogether. And I understand what that is in the views of, of protect yourself and the way the strategy has been put forward. Right. I think that's, if I may, that that is an extraordinary philosophical question, but Okay, this is my special subject, Councillor Skinner. So, if it's of any help at all, so I'm all ears. Yeah, I'm all ears. Yeah, well, well, there's been a debate going on for years, hasn't there, about high culture versus low culture, and I've always considered that any culture is culture, and that's it. So, whether it is Councillor Wibley with his guitar in the Bicton Arms, or whether it's uh, as we had in Collison the other day a visiting theatre troupe doing a performance of Alice in Wonderland outside on some scaffolding for the Colliton and Colliford Memory Cafe, or a play at the Northcott, or a concert at West Point, or somebody just sitting down reading a book on a bench. It's absolutely everything. And, and the key thing here for us must be that what we do excludes nothing and is fully inclusive. I think, I think that's what culture is. Culture obviously then... It goes into other things, doesn't it? Like your sense of identity, whether it's uh, national or ethnic or religious or whatever. But I think for the purposes of this council's work, it is to try and support uh, and engage with every form of cultural activity uh, and not to exclude any. And that's why I think, you know, a, a second or third reading of the report will show how profound the engagement has been with local 
it's a word I don't particularly like, but practitioners, in other words, people who are actually actually out there doing it. The key, however, to me, which has been, I think, the tone we set at the beginning of this process, um, you know, getting on for two years ago, was the reality is if it doesn't cover its face financially, in the end, it perishes and it withers on the vine. And that, that is something we need to bear in mind. And so what this report has done, as somebody has said earlier, has put us in the place, we have got the rationale now to go upstairs to the Regional Arts Council, the National Arts Council, philanthropic organisations as well, and say, well, look, this is what we're doing in East Devon. It's now captured in one document. How can you help us from here? So that's what... Um, but Charlie, do you, want to, do you want to quarrel with any of that? or Not at all. Absolutely. Fully <laughs> Well, you endorse what you're saying, Chair, and I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it, it covers, and I think Phil's touched on it, it covers a wide range of areas. And I don't think we're being overly prescriptive about it because there's fantastic links to the work that uh, Andy's team will bring forward um, shortly with the tourism strategy, um, real links there with cultural tourism. So it's, it's almost impossible to pigeonhole it into one specific category one sort of definition mm -hmm. and I think that's the beauty of it because it gives us mm -hmm. huge amount of opportunities to engage in um, multiple areas um, putting forward lots of potential um, funding bits etc and working with the local community as well um, you know we could probably spend you know the next hour or two discussing you know um, what it means and, and the benefits it brings but uh, I know we want to get yeah. home I'm trying um, to remember, Phil, when you go at Exeter City, I can't remember the song. It, might, it can't just be, come on, you Grecians. Is there something no. else that you said? Oh, okay. Oh, Councillor Gazzard helping us here. You've no, you know, no revved him up. No, we're not going to get on the side of tonight. Councillor, right, okay. Right, right. Shall I, shall well, that, I... to, me, to my mind, that's culture as well. Seriously. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's it's very strange, and without us having a, just a debate between you and ourselves, um, um, Chair, um, uh, and obviously I want to hear from many others, but culture to me, if I, if I may, Charlie, which, which forms back to me as, as, as identity, as, and you touched on that earlier, can actually fall back into the rural areas about what culture is about food mm. and drink, those sorts of things. Mm. And that is culture as well, as much as what you just touched on about Exeter City Football Club, because not just defining Exeter City Football Club or just football as a sport, but sport generally is also part of our culture, whatever that is going to be. So when that, that, this is my definition of culture. When, when I read some of these reports, sometimes the way that they put it is arts and culture, and it tends to do the arts part of it, which is great, and I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I've got a business myself that engages in, in very much in art. But to me, the when you say culture, that's a, that is a very big, wide remit and I just wonder how wide a remit we're on here. And listen, I'm not against any of what we're trying to do. What I'm trying to do is define what culture is in our minds, because that is what's going to set us about the path of path of travel of which we're going to take. What do we include in? What do we do we not include in? And it seems to me that at the minute it's nearly going to include culture, could nearly include just about anything and everything. And uh, we just need to be just a little bit careful about where that's going because we we need to be defining down to a little bit about what what what, what that means where that is tourism is fantastic food drink agriculture farming sport those sorts of things all the other stuff that goes with it as well from the arts side and including uh, mr councillor wibbly with his guitar and that's absolutely fine and that's all that's all great stuff that's where we are so, so I was just trying to, so if you don't mind, Chair, what I was trying to do is to get so, a bit of but to get the culture thing and just try to, to understand what, what and that, the reason I asked you, Charlie, that question oh, was because yeah. I was just trying to say, just was it defined? Really, I was getting to that point. Are you defining it? Well, it sounds like you're not, Chair and um, Charlie. No, I, th I, think, I think probably you're asking a question that has been a concerning man for three to four thousand years, probably, Philip. So let's. But let's see how we, how we work it out through our own, our own processes. I suppose if somebody wanted a really fast route into it, they should go to the Honiton Beehive, look at the programme they went across the year. Absolutely everything, you know, dance and theatre and poetry, oh, yeah, yeah. and so all of that, you know. So anyway, yeah. right, we're brilliant discussion. Now, back to the agenda. Um, so after that philosophical digression, Councillor Peter Faithful, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm afraid it's not 
I'm not going away from that subject. All I was going to do is give a quote from the Oxford Dictionary, which I would have thought would be helpful to everyone. Um, the arts and manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. Number two, the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. There you go, from the Oxford English Dictionary, Googled. <laughs> oh, you really had me until you said Googled. I was just imagining you reaching for that from under your desk, Councillor Faithful, but fair, fair enough. Thank you for that. Well, well, this is the most highbrow meeting we've ever had. Um, so thank you. For, let's come to uh, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Thank. Oopsie. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Can I can I say thanks for a, a great document? Um, as as has already been said, I mean, culture can cover any anything really. Um, it depends on on the individual, but it's really great to see that East Devon going to pick the baton up and run with this. I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in getting us this far. And in particular, I'd like to thank um, my very good friend, Councillor Joe Wibley. Um, I know he's worked extremely hard on this. He's been extremely energetic. And I know he's done a lot around um, my wonderful town of Exmouth to try and promote the consultation on this. So thanks, Joe. Um, you're very dedicated and you're a great singer and a damn good guitarist by the way and if if we are going to cut a ribbon could i just ask that the chair puts a bit of white in it please tonight what's that for council like i'm missing the uh i'm missing well, the reference. Red, well we were talking about extra oh, right. a bit of red and white and a bit of chalk yeah, oh, now you've got me. OK, right. Now, <laughs> next speaker, please. Councillor Nick Hookway, our supremo for these matters. Thank you, Chair. How do I follow that? Well, uh, interestingly, you know, our discussion about what is culture. Um, thanks to Councillor Faithful for his um, uh, definition for the dictionary and also for Councillor Skinner for his, his question. And I think for us within East Devon, it can be simply... Um, it's simply the way we live. It's simply what we do. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because in in getting to um, getting the strategy going and helping and, and uh, asking officers what to do, I went on a number of courses and I spoke to somebody, a councillor in Leeds. And in Leeds, they have well over 100 separate ethnic groups and they have to cater for the culture of every single one of those ethnic groups. Now, uh, in East Devon, it's slightly different because we don't have uh, that number of ethnic groups, but we do have a very large number of people who do a quite extraordinary range of activities that can be dis described as cultural. And uh, so what this strategy is trying to, to achieve is to link in those cultural activities in all their glory with the fact that actually by having these cultural activities they are benefiting our economy and they are leading to economic growth and if we enable them and encourage them and nurture them and support them we may actually get greater economic growth. Uh, and uh, that's something that many, many other councils across uh, the country have been doing for some time. So in some ways, we're playing catch up uh, for that. But but it is something that I think it is very important. Um, I, I also want to say that in East Devon, with our culture, we are tied in very closely with uh, the tourism uh, and the hospitality that goes on within the district. And uh, when the tourism strategy comes uh, before council in, in uh, the autumn, you will notice that there are clear links and statements linking both the culture strategy and the tourism strategy. That is at the request of hospitality. OK, because they understand that whenever there's a cultural event, whenever there's a festival or, or a book exhibition or an art exhibition or whatever happens, that brings in people to our district. And that's really, really important. So 
it, it's a it's a case really of having a, a a synergy between a whole range of activities which benefits us economically. Now, the other thing which uh, I've also done on courses recently and is really important, and I do want to draw your attention to, is theme eight within the strategy, which specifically refer, refers to data collection, to evidence those benefits that the cultural strategy will bring. It's all very well saying, oh, yeah, yeah let's do some culture, let's have a bit of art, but we have to prove that it's benefiting us uh, uh, the, the the area. Uh, and this is going to be a critical role for the cultural producer, and it will help members uh, in um, seeing the benefits of the cultural strategy. Uh, again, this is something that's ongoing in other districts. A lot of work is going on in other districts about collecting data in all its forms to support culture in all its forms. Okay, the other the other thing that's very important, if we collect data and we have our consultations, we have our strategy, we can then go forward and start bidding for funding from national bodies such as the Art Council and Natural, natural, natural Lottery and others and so on. Okay, so um, the consultation was carried out by FEI and it was very well supported by both residents, art uh, organisations and businesses. So I'd like to thank, place on record my thanks to all those who took part and shared their views in the development of the strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Nick. Brilliant report and thank you for all your work as well. Uh, coming to Councillor Jeff Young, please. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, no, what, what a fantastic night we're having. That we're, we're talking about culture and we're talking about pleasure strategies, uh, uh, which, which is fantastic. Uh, interesting that there are, <clears throat> these were both part of my portfolio when I took over. And I quickly realised once I took over that um, I had too much on my plate. And I'm glad that uh, Councillor Nick Hookway and in... Uh, uh, now, another large part, uh, Joe Wibley has taken the um, uh, baton and got these two strategies through. Um, absolutely uh, brilliant. And now uh, I would like to, um, has someone proposed it yet? Because I would second it. No, please move it, Jeff. That yeah, would be I would like to propose uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the proposal. And That's also... Oh, yeah. Sorry, Jeff. Carry on. Yeah, and can I just remind uh, uh, councillors that there are other football clubs available? Well, we have no interest in any of that. It isn't in Devon, I'm afraid. Um, that that much about culture, we are sure of. Uh, okay, right, Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Well, if you want a real cultural experience, obviously come oh. on. Here we go, yeah. Brentford here we go. Football Club. I'll have to get that in. Everybody else has mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pleased to second him. Can we move on now and take the vote, please? Definitely. <laughs> and can I thank Philip Skinner for his discipline in not coming in at that point with a further comment on football clubs? Right, we have a proposal, a second. Uh, can we go through? Right, Jack, I was going to interrupt. Um, so oh, you uh, by the them. way, before Henry says anything, I, of course, when I said let's go to a vote, what I meant was let us revisit the uh, minutes from the... <laughs> from item, item 12, the Arts and Culture Forum. Uh, how do we deal with those? In well, they're, they're actually picked up. So both minute five and seven are already effectively covered in the recommendation. So you don't need to do anything. They're, all, they're already captured. Um, however, having just looked at them afresh, I note that minute two, which has nothing to do with this, uh, obviously hasn't been dealt with. So if you can add in also agreement to minute two from that meeting, and that will go on to council. Okay. Which is the point of the council book way. Yeah. The vice as Thank vice you. chair for the arts and culture forum okay brilliant thank you right with that understood and uh, let us go to the vote please amanda okay chair that's seven votes in favor chair brilliant thank you so much everybody thank you everybody for your contributions on that um, again, let's try and pick up some pace here, if we can. Um, uh, we've got, not, not from you, Andy, but from us members, uh, Agenda Item 16, the Devon, Plymouth and Torbay devolution deal update from uh, our service lead for growth, development and prosperity, Andy Wood. Over to you, please, Andy. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Phil Adams, uh, who's the Programme Director for the Devon, Plymouth and Torbay County Deal, who's joined us oh, tonight. Welcome, welcome, Phil. Very grateful for you to, to for attending. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm just going to um, give a very quick overview, Chair, and then hand over to Phil, who's going to bring us right up to date. Uh, so the background to this report uh, is um, essentially formed by the Leveling Up White Paper, which was published in February. That was followed by a report to the 2nd of March Cabinet meeting, um, which included identifying the fact that um, Devon, Plymouth and Dor Torbay have been identified as one of nine pilot areas for a potential county deal. The purpose of the report is to update you on progress since that point. Um, particularly, you'll see at Appendix B is a copy of the devolution proposal that's been submitted to government. And that's very much around a level two deal, as it's known, which is a combined authority without a mayor. Um, in the report, there's a couple of um, issues arising that are highlighted, one around um, the potential um, moving of powers um, to, the, uh, to the combined authority, uh, which is provided for within the levelling up and regeneration bill. Uh, and secondly, around the future deployment of the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, particularly into year three, obviously that uh, investment plan was signed off. Uh, and thank you to members. Um, as the urgent item uh, earlier on in the agenda this evening. Uh, so on that basis, I'm just going to hand over to Phil now, if he's happy to give uh, uh, bring us up to speed in terms of current negotiations. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, uh, good evening, uh, members, and, and thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so as, as Andy set out, we are continuing with our discussions around the devolution proposal. Um, if members have, have sort of gone through the, the detail, the, the current uh, proposal remains a, a new form county combined authority um, with a mixed district, uh, county and unitary council leadership, um, which is something that we've never sort of had before. This is a new model that's being pursued. Um, we are, as an area, pretty disciplined about that. We are avoiding any of the other governance models that have come forward, and we've made it very clear that that is our proposal. And we've been having that discussion with government now for about three or four months. Um, I think um, it's fair to say that it's been a lot slower than we would have liked. Um, progress around the country, not just in Devon, has been slower than we would have liked. Uh, government has struggled to resource this process, and some of the things that you'll have seen and discussed in the press around levelling up um, we have seen similar on the ground, um, but we are now in a position where we had a discussion with the minister um, or leaders did, and uh, it was Councillor Deeds representing the districts um, uh, on the 9th of June. Uh, the minister confirmed the intent of government to continue with a level two negotiation with us as a group of 11. Um, that's due to be taken forward in early September. Um, the intent there is that we would have a negotiation followed by a deal that would be put back to all 11 authorities um, and then uh, subject to us being comfortable, we would have a go, no go uh, sort of decision point at the end of the calendar year, looking to move into something next year. Um, there is a long way to go on this. It is very early days and there's a lot of work going on. As part of that, uh, district council members, county council members and wider stakeholders are working together at the moment around clarifying some detail around the asks that are in that template that Andy's mentioned. Um, and we are slowly, slowly starting to work through some of the granular detail that will sit behind some of this. I suppose the two elephants in the room at the moment, and it's highlighted in the paper, one is that the white paper is going through Parliament and the district council network, county council network and local government association have all registered concerns about government's handling of one particular area. We are working with MPs and around a number of others to flag those because I don't think anybody agrees with some of the content of Clause 16. That's the one that sort of uh, isn't clear about the, the uh, Secretary of State's powers. Um, and we as county and also as unitary authorities aren't as com com comfortable with that one. Um, the other side of it is that, um, and members may have noticed, the last two weeks have been somewhat bouncy. Um, and we did end up in a bizarre situation at one point where we got a letter from the minister and then four hours later he resigned. Um, <laughs> so it has been a slightly tricky process, but we've been assured by DLUC colleagues uh, that devolution remains a priority for all uh, eight. I think we've now got leadership contenders going forward and number 10. Um, and it, it is going to be something that they want to focus on into the autumn. So that's sort of where we are for now. Um, as I said, it is very early days. Um, we are keeping leaders, members uh, and wider stakeholders engaged as much as we possibly can. But to a degree, we're in a holding pattern working on preliminary work. 
uh, until they've finished with other areas. The one to watch, uh, if I was providing advice, is our colleagues over in Cornwall, where it sounds like they will be prepared to announce something around their deal over the next two to three weeks. And that will start to give a feel for how serious government is taking this whole process. Um, and I'll probably pause there, Andy, if it's okay. Okay, Andy, do you want to come back in or shall we press on to members? Press on, Chair. Okay. Um, Phil, can I just ask two, just two, two for starters? Uh, one, you know, 60 seconds if you can, what's going on in Somerset at the moment and what's the direction of travel there as, as, a, as, a, as a governmental structure? Uh, and two, can we be uh, wholly satisfied that, um, oh, this is a deliberately provocative question, that this isn't the thin end of the wedge to the abolition of district councils? They're just those two. Yeah, so I'll deal with them in, in order of ease, because Somerset's probably the easier question. Um, so, uh, Somerset, the unitarisation is due to take place on the 31st of, um, 31st of March, 1st of April. Um, they are in the process of agreeing their shared priorities and some of their structures. As part of that, they will be looking for devolution as part of the next five-year plan. We know that. They've, they've sort of said that in passing. They are actually pushing, we think, and from, from discussions we've had, the early elements of devolution as part of the unitarization. I mean, unsurprisingly, and I know that the LEP has discussed this elsewhere, if we get to a point where we're folding in our elements of the LEP, they want a sensible solution around their elements over the other side of the boundary. Um, and there are a number of other things where we work together. On the joint committee, and I think, uh, Chair, I'm not sure if it was yourself or other members were involved in the discussion the other day, the intent at the moment, I think, is to work through until unitarisation and then we split it in two with links across the boundary and continuing to work together, mm. but actually starting to simplify our sort of governance structures. Um, so I think Somerset is on a twin track. I think Great South West, which was announced in the week, which brings together um, the sort of seven uh, areas, upper tier areas um, with the district councils, will give us an extra layer of uh, sort of regional uh, um, governance is the wrong word. Collaboration, I think, is going to be the right word for where we're going around some of the pan-national um, sort of collaborations. Um, areas where we'll be able to sit down as groups and talk about shared priorities, but without some of the governance structure. And that seems to be the way that government wants to do the sort of cross-area working going forward. Somerset will be a partner in that, and that's that's the way it's likely to work. So slightly longer than 60 seconds, but overall, yes. That's OK. It was, yeah. it was a good, good form of um, it. <laughs> going back to the thin edge of the wedge, so, yeah. and Chair, you'll have heard this and members will have heard this from John and from members on the county side. That's, our view is that's completely unacceptable if we are. Um, the view in Devon is it works. Why would we mess with that? And I think looking around the, the members that we have at the moment, looking around all sides, so not just the, the governing group, but also the other members, the appetite there towards move towards anything that would resemble a unitarization or a review of government isn't on the cards from the local side. Now, on the government side, they've said it's not. I mean, that, that was part of the renew, review with the white paper. They've said to us, we do not intend to move along that route. We have changed the way we're doing this. We're not going to push mayors. We're going to allow for cabinet style arrangements, which allow for a, um, you know, more of a, a split of powers. They've allowed um, a mix of authorities into the room and around the table, and we've got opportunities to discuss how that will work in our area. And we're holding them to that. I think we flagged, and I know... You know, DCN colleagues have, CCN colleagues have, that we don't want to move away from that because we don't think it's a good use of time. And we've been saying that, you know, for the last 10 years now. So from my point of view, I'm quite happy to stand in public and say it can't be. If it is, then when it's not in line with the way that we've approached this. The whole point of devolution is to do more together, not to put in place a process that stops that. That would, that would be madness. And I think Councillor Hart, if he was here, or Phil, or any of, our, any of the ones from the county side, and district colleagues from around the patch, as you've heard, would all say the same. Can I guarantee that future government ministers aren't going to push us there again? That is tricky. I think the best thing that we can do as a group is stay as close together as we possibly can. So, yeah. thanks. No, that's that's that that's in accord with everything I've heard through team meetings and, and my own analysis. 
But for what it's worth, you know, our ultimate backstop, isn't it, as East Devon, which I suspect, I can't speak for them, would be the same view of Exeter at the very least, is uh, if it does go down an alley we're not expecting, then it's going down it without us. And, you know, see you in court, basically. OK, fantastic. Uh, really brilliant. Uh, Councillor Philip Skinner, please. And uh, I endorse all the words you just said, Chair. I mean, I, I, I've been paramount in, in my belief that uh, East Devon District Council serves its authority well, its people well, uh, over the years in whichever for whichever format that is. I might not think that the, the current leadership chair is no offence to be taken, but I would sooner see it as in conservative control. Of course, I would. That's why we're here. That's what it's all about. But regardless of all of that, as a people's together, I believe very much in the district council setup. So uh, uh, thank you, Phil, for coming along. I've not met you before, but um, uh, no doubt you'll probably get used to my face at, at, at different times. Um, the, the thing is with it, with this structure is 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 really we've got it backs backs against the wall a little bit. Everywhere in the country is going to a unitary um, process. I happen to think that unitary can work quite well, and I and I give uh, I give examples of that. I think Manchester works quite well in very high urban areas. Unitary can work really well. In our scenario where we live, I think it would be an absolute failure. And and there are failures around at unitary. Uh, around of course and and I, and I and I would probably probably cite uh, and here we are on YouTube but I'll go I'll go on record and say that that Torbay wouldn't be necessarily one that has been a particularly successful uh, unitary bid and what I find strange uh, with this in in some respects is that when you see the work that Exeter City as an authority has achieved and Exeter City being a a city uh, compared to Torbay um, being a, a smaller patch, but obviously within the incumbent areas, make it into a bigger with the numbers of people. I really find it bizarre that you have uh, Plymouth City Council and Torbay Council and Exeter City Council aren't there as a representative uh, as, a, as a city. But I absolutely understand within the structure because it's set up within the unitary authority process. And so it's done in that structure. But that structure is not particularly good. And it doesn't work particularly well. Um, I think uh, Plymouth City works as as a, as working in itself as a unitary. The Torbay one doesn't. And the team representatives then becomes the eleven of us working. And our representation chair. I think I would like to think that we had uh, and other members and colleagues that we had a little bit more of rep representation within that sort of board process. Um, and I'm disappointed at that. But what I would say. Uh, at this particular moment in time, I think this is much better than a unitary process. And so we've got our backs up against the wall. We're not going to stay as we were. We had the guest process, which was was looking like it was going to be quite successful. And that went to one side for whatever reasons. I don't want to get involved in all of that. But that that was would have been would have been quite a good process of protection as long as the authorities are concerned. And this is a, this is a sort of a plan B approach, if you mind to have it in, in, in my view. Um, so I'm supportive of this because I don't like the alternative, but I don't actually think that this is particularly uh, the perfect, um, shall we say, uh, meal, but it is certainly better than the alternative that, 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 that could be coming down the road. I am, I am very much um, grateful for you, Phil, if I may call you that, um, for your approach in knowing, and I do know from John Hart, that he doesn't want to go down a unitary approach. I don't think it serves it will serve Devon well at all. The disparity between people from North Devon and I know I've got many family in North Devon to a city for like Exeter. The difference is is massive. And different types of people. Back to the culture, uh, Councillor Hookway about the types of culture that people are, and it, that's about the whole point of what this is all about. It's people serving the people of which they know the areas and the people of which they live with on a day to day basis. That's what local authorities is on about. And that's really important. And decision making done by people that do not come off and understand the patch which they're making decisions on is not is not right or correct, in my view. So, Chair, if you don't mind, I will wind up on this point. But it's really important that me uh, myself, as the leader of the opposition as well, that we are joined together in going forward, I think, in the way of joining up with this, because I think it's much better than the alternative. So that, I'm giving you a view from uh, what I would try to say, if I may speak for my members, from my camp, 
that this is better than an alternative. And I think we would be on, on board with this, but I still don't think it's quite made up. And I do feel whenever I've, uh, when, over the many years that we've had, uh, Plymouth Exeter mm-hmm. always seem to become subsidiary to Plymouth from a central government perspective. That would not be helpful for us in particular. So that's just one anomaly that I would sort of pick out if we could work on that. I'm not sure how you're going to, and perhaps uh, yourself and myself, Chair, uh, we could have a discussion around that. I'm not sure how you're going to do do all of those things, um, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm very, I'm, 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 I'm just, you know, the tall bay with Exeter not being in it. And if you look at the stats on the economic agenda that Exeter has achieved over the period of time and how they want to grow, which affects us in the way of Exeter working and its surrounding areas, we are a key part. Exeter, East Devon, Team Bridge and Mid Devon is the key to Devon as the authorities that are set up here. We become successful and build from that. I'll leave it to that, Chair, because... Um, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Councillor Skinner. That's very, very reassuring. And the point has been repeatedly made by me um, that while this looks like something, uh, you know, let's move it, let's move ahead with it, make it work. Well, I'm looking at the diagrammatic uh, for representation there. So Team Devon is represented by, well, the leader of Devon County. Uh, and then you have uh, the leader of the Devon District Council Network. And at the moment, that's Bob Deeds. It will be filled by Alec, I think, at the end of the year from Exeter. But there's parity between those districts with their populations and, for example, our population in East Devon is actually, I believe, slightly higher than Torbay, but Torbay gets its own you know, seat at the table, so kind of thing. I can yeah. really see why that is, because of where they're coming from. Plymouth, obviously, is a major city. But we will, I can assure you, keep an eye on that. Phil knows we're keeping an eye on that. Um, and um, But thank you. Good. Right, let's move on now to Councillor Peter Faithful. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at Devon Devolution Proposal Appendix B. I think I'm on page 10. And I'm reading, at present, each of the constituent upper tier authorities within the area have produced a bus service improvement plan. We've just had our bus service reduced. I don't know what a bus service improvement plan looks like, but it does it mean we get our old bus service we just lost put back again? I don't know. But the bus service has re- just been reduced and it comes out in the end of this month. The new bus timetable. Yeah, no, thanks, Councillor Faithful. I must say, I share your frustration that one reads in document stuff that one simply knows is not what's happening. Uh, there we go. It, sometimes it's optimistic, isn't it? But it's a point well made and I think should be noted. Uh, Councillor Hookway, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Phil for his report. Um, I'm prepared to note the report, as we are asked to do, but I have very grave misgivings about what's been said and what's laid down here. This strikes me as being an illogical and undemocratic solution that I, for one, am very unhappy about. Uh, I actually lived in, in Plymouth. Uh, for over 20 years at one time and uh, was there before Plymouth was a unitary authority when it was completely ignored by Devon when Devon ran it. Plymouth changed dramatically and improved for the better when it became a unitary authority. And then uh, it seems to be trying to throw that all away. Uh, In East Devon, we have a good authority with good services. Why on earth would we want to do anything to to change that. Okay, I really am very concerned about this and I shall be continuing to monitor this and uh, speak against this. And um, I think having heard also what Councillor Skinner has just said, uh, my, uh, my concerns are even greater. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Hookway. Uh, I'm sure you speak for a lot of people uh, in that, uh, me included. I think we should note it today. It's been a very interesting report. Um, but, you know, we send consistent signals, which is don't push us on this. The other thing that comes up a lot and is said by other district leaders is actually how much money is, how much money is going to come down for this. I mean, the Great Southwest, I think there's talk of, you know, a million and a half has come down. But then, you know, spread that around. What's that actually going to do? 
So um, you, you're going to need to make a gain of many, many tens of millions of pounds for this to be actually worth it uh, for us. However, that is the, 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 that is the set of rules that the government has asked us to play by at the moment. And like it or not, you know, we, we, we're not in the game. Uh, we, we're not going to score, are we? Um, so any more speakers on this? No. So... Um, Councillor Hook, well, I'm, I'm going to take what you said as a, as a proposal to note. Uh, Councillor Rowland. Uh, I was going to do exactly that, Chair, and uh, so that we note the report. Thank you. OK. I won't make you second it, Nick. Shall I get somebody else? Councillor Hayward? I'll, I'll second oh, it. Mm, no, okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, can we go to a vote, please? That's seven votes in favour, Chair. OK, that's great. Andy, thank you very much uh, for your report and for bringing Phil in as well. Phil, thank you for your time this evening. I'm sure we'll, we'll see you again. Uh, and next time will be uh, really challenging. That was, just a, that was just a softener there. So thank you very much. Right, now we go to agenda item 17, uh, Broad Henbury, I believe that's right, actually, isn't it? Yes, Broad Henbury Parish Council. Corporate Governance Review. Um, we have a report from Mark, which I suspect is going to be read the reports. But Mark, over to you, please. Yeah, as set out on page 153, please, Chair. Thank you. That's, that's the kind of report we need at this time of the evening. Thank you. Uh, members, would anybody like to comment on that? Uh, uh, Can I question the ward member, please? Yes, please. Can you keep it under two minutes, Phil, please? Because we're, we're, oh, we're... I, I could I could be quicker than two minutes, I hope. Uh, well, um, I'm timing you then. Okay, one, <laughs> two... I'm hoping I'll be, I'll be quicker than two minutes. But okay. th this, this, is, this is really uh, uh, a, a report brought forward by the chairman and, and uh, uh, Bob Nelson, who is a fantastic chairman, I might say, and he's really brought the village together uh, and doing lots of great work. And, and actually, their, their, their annual report that he put out was just, well, put me in the shade, really. It made me feel a little bit embarrassed of the work that he did, considering he's got a parish and I've got, got, got a district to do with. And that's the sort of level he's at. What he's getting, what he's happening here is, is that there are lots of people, obviously parish councils are working very much on, um, on the fact of a volunteer basis. And there are lots of people who, when you spread the load and people feel a bit more involved, um, that, that they can get a little bit more traction in people coming on because it's quite difficult to put lots of work onto different people. That's partly the process why this was brought forward. I'm very supportive of it. I've been supportive of it from day one when he brought it forward. I'm glad to see it here. So I'm right behind it and I don't think it's much more to add. Is that less than two minutes, Chair? That is less than one minute. Fantastic. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, I no, mean, no, no, don't add to it. Otherwise you'll ruin it. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> OK, Councillor Dan Ledger, please. Thanks, Chair. Happy to propose the recommendation set out in the report. Councillor Jack Rowland. Happy to second, as he beat me to it. As he Amanda, can we, can we get to a vote, that please? Youth then? again. Yeah, well, <laughs> Amanda, vote, please. Thank you. That's seven votes in favour, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I am now at agenda item 18, the Collingford Community Governance Review, as I've already declared an interest in this. Uh, can you send me into the um, sort of void, please, uh, while this is led by Councillor Paul Hayward? Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Steve. Sorry, everyone's just disappeared off. Just the wrong um, so uh, we have a report from Henry Gordon Lennox, if we might, Henry, if, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so uh, just one very quick correction. In paragraph nine, it refers to Appendix 3. I should say Appendix 2. Um, so, I mean, and the report stands for itself, really. Obviously, you've had two uh, speakers tonight, one from the Parish Council and one from the CVRA. Uh, I mean... CVRA's business plan is set out in the appendix uh, and obviously you can take from um, uh, what was said by the Paris Council there is sufficient information that's gone into the production of that. Uh, I'm not sure the CVRA would agree with the, the comments from the, C, uh, from the Paris Council earlier. Um, uh, and any other commentary I was going to make about the 
parish council's comment uh, is that the the majority of comments that were referred to about uh, being negative is probably right but on the other hand that's not necessarily representative of the numbers it's merely those who are prepared to comment so i don't think looking at comments in isolation um, and suggesting that, that gives a, a significant number against is is accurate the numbers are detailed in the report and the percentages uh, and in our view or my view um, you know, there is sufficient detail and information there to suggest that this is uh, in the interest of the communities. Um, so uh, for, for discussion members, I'm happy to take any questions that there may be. Um, and uh, I suppose the only other thing to note really is that the, um, I'm picking up the comments on the um, boundaries, is that the next stage consultation will look in much more detail about the boundary lines and, and engage with the, the residents who are along the boundary line um, with a view to whether or not, and this is if you agree to moving forward, yeah, it, it's to get a greater um, idea of whether or not they want to sit one side of the line or not. So there, will, there could be some further refinement that's acknowledged in the report, um, but uh, otherwise happy to discuss as, um, as required, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. Um, so yes, noting Henry's comments and thank you for the two speakers earlier. Before we go into um, seeking comments, again, there was a particular reference made to the finances and some sort of questioning of the, of the finances. Um, Again, Henry just alluded to it on page 194 is a financial plan. So if any members have concerns that that hasn't been covered, might I draw your attention to that while we're having this discussion? Um, are there any members from outside committee? I can't see any. Uh, so in that case, I come to Councillor Dan Ledger. Dan, the floor is yours. Can I declare an interest, Henry, uh, just an effects NRI? I'm just looking at this kind of... I, I'm, I live next door to the boundary, basically. Um, yeah, I didn't see that before, sorry. And then just with that, I'm happy to uh, recommend uh, one to four um, in, as listed in the report. Henry, just with the timeline of this, so is it all, obviously in the last report, it stated that it would be in, in line for the next elections. Is this, it's, it felt that this would be the exact same uh, and does that need to go into the recommendation? Any uh, so the, yeah, so the, the period for well, the, the timeline that's been established has this running through to a decision in December. Um, so council will ultimately, can, ideally, council will conclude in December, the order can then be made uh, and the order will be of effect from um, the May elections. Okay, so yeah, we're, still, we're, we're slightly behind, but we're still, we're still, there's a little bit of flex at the end of the programme. So yeah, we're still, we're still on track to it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Henry, for that clarification. Councillor Young, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Um, now, the, the uh, thoughts of um, splitting these uh, two communities up uh, seems to be well thought out. It seems to uh, be a lot of... Um, uh, been a lot of input in it, a lot of support for it. Uh, yes, there's some... Um, uh, uh, objections to it but I think um, the train has left the station we can't stop it now I think we should um, let the process proceed um, and we've got the boundaries to be discussed and to be um, finalized and I, I, I would support it thank you thank you very much indeed um, Councillor Jackson over to you thank you chair um yeah, I think it's quite clear that um, there's been a lot of work uh, put into uh, this whole process from both um, residents and as well as the, the officers of the, the council. And I think the, um, the feedback gives us quite a clear steer that this is worth pursuing. Um, I think the, the points of consternation there are things that need to be ironed out as the process progresses. So reasonably comfortable with that um so i'm quite happy to second the recommendation thank you very much um councillor roland actually as i hadn't been i was going to second but councillor jackson's already done that um i'm totally in favor of this when it first came in front of us to consider um originally i was totally in favor of it then i've seen no reason to change my mind so thank you 
Thank you very much. Um, before we go to the vote, um, for, for what it's worth from myself, um, when we first discussed this, I mentioned that I am the clerk still um, to two parishes that were riven. In 1990, uh, Childstock Parish Council split for circumstances. If you read their minutes, you'll understand why and became All Saints Parish and became Childstock Parish. Very similar situation, um, perhaps slightly the other way around, but All Saints had to stand on its own two feet, had to become financially uh, viable. And people who thought they lived in Childstock Parish suddenly lived in, all, uh, lived in All Saints Parish. Well, fast forward 32 years, um, they all get along like house on fire. They, they interact, they share, they liaise, they cooperate. It's not the end of the world, it really isn't. Uh, but a democratic decision has been made uh, so we have a proposal, we have a seconder. Um, Amanda, could you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you could vote, please. And that's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. That's very kind of you, Amanda. And if you could um, retrieve uh, Councillor Arnott again from the waiting room. Um, that's feel very bad. And here's Councillor Arnott. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Can I ask the conclusion of the last item, Councillor Hayward? What was decided? A unanimous uh, support for the recommendations as listed, Chair. OK, thank you very much indeed. Right, now we go to agenda item 19, the Kilmington Neighbourhood Plan Examiner's Report. Over to our CEO, Mark Williams, again, please. Thanks. So if you um, have a look at page 201 of the agenda, you'll see that we've got to the stage in the process where the draft plan uh, for Kilmington has received the examiner's endorsement. Uh, so if you're content with that, then we would now go to the formal referendum uh, to see whether the, um, the electorate of Kilmington wish to actually vote in support and adopt the um, plan. So it's authority to go to the referendum version, essentially. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, members, are there any questions on that? Uh, if not, <laughs> there are rather fewer of you left than they were when I was put in the waiting room. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Dan Ledger, please. Thanks, Chair. Can I propose uh, one, two, and especially three, just congratulate, uh, firstly, the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Jack Rowland. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a calamity. Um, yeah, happy to second. Thank uh, you. Um, Ledger has beat me to it again. Yes, yeah. <laughs> can, uh, I just, can I just throw in, Chair, however, that Councillor Rowland beat me to it, so I don't know what that says about my reflexes. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Right, OK, so um, in which case, Amanda, can you take us to a vote on that, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you could cast your vote, please. And that's unanimous in favour, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, now we come to Joe Fallows. I'm so sorry to keep forgiving you waiting all evening, Joe. Uh, agenda item 20, the apprenticeship levy transfer policy. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. Um, so this uh, paper is about utilising one element of the government's apprenticeship levy funding rules, whereby we can transfer some of our apprenticeship levy funds to uh, fund apprenticeship training in other organisations. Um, and it's something we haven't used before as a council, but it fits really well with our uh, resilient um, economy priority. Um, it, it will also complement um, our internal use of apprenticeships, which as many of you know, we, we're looking to grow as linked to our, grow our own work, so, but, but you know, we'll be maintaining the balance between the two. Um, and the paper sets out the draft policy and the eligibility criteria on page 237. Um, I've worked with Andy Wood and his team um, uh, on this so that we've ensured that the criteria that we've drafted in the uh, draft policy aligns with the existing business rates policy. Um, applications would be uh, coordinated by uh, my team, but um, we'll obviously liaise with Andy and his team with regard to making decisions against the eligibility criteria if they've um, agreed this evening. Um, and the any activity with regard to apprenticeship uh, levy transfer uh, spend will form part of the annual people data report that um, I've just updated and includes apprenticeship levy spend. So going forward, it will include, you know, levy transfer activity as part of that. 
um, and that will be presented you know on an annual basis to personnel committee uh, so happy to take any questions if, that, if that's helpful thanks joe can i just ask one out of curiosity really which is um given that we've got uh, an undersupply in the labour market at the moment, would you expect that there will still be um, uh, people coming forward wanting to be involved in these apprenticeships? How, how does it, uh, how is it a, a more attractive offer than, than other jobs that aren't able to be filled yeah. at the moment? Well, funnily enough, we did see, because apprenticeships have been starting to grow, that, you know, now they're available at lots of different levels, um, from sort of entry level through to graduate master's level and across a wider range of occupational areas, including things like solicitors, teachers, those sorts of areas. Um, so we were seeing growth. And interestingly, then the latter part of this of last year, we were we we had some you know entry level business admin apprenticeships in revenue and benefits and were struggling to fill, but we've suddenly had an influx. Um, so I think part of the issue, certainly for young people, was um, with the economic economic uncertainty wanting to stay in education and training rather than step out into the employment market but it feels like that's starting to change um, and certainly our local apprenticeship training providers you know like the uh, FE colleges are you know really big on promoting this um, you know to young people who come through their door and before you know when they're still in secondary schools as well and, and you know we're doing that as well promoting our apprenticeships with our East Devon secondary schools and so on so it seems to be growing again but we'll have to wait and see whether that's a consistent growth or whether it's just a blip but um is there is there emerging evidence that that um young people may be choosing this as an alternative to going to university yes definitely um yeah. and the government you know the government with their career strategy with schools um are saying that schools have to have a more balanced approach so you know if you've got academic students where perhaps you would have worked with them to you know to, to persuade them towards university actually you need to give them a balanced approach it's not just about university there are other routes to get degrees um so that's that's part of the work that should be happening in schools and is being developed lovely thanks joe very much for that um councillor paul hayward please thank you chair um again joe thank you for sticking around for so long it's it's you know it's your evening too um uh, really chair just to wholeheartedly uh, applaud what we're doing uh, and to support this and to to propose it uh, in my role as uh, economy portfolio holder um i can see under 1.1 you know we had to give 35000 pound back every officer every member here hates giving money back to hmg uh, because it seems like a bit of a failure it wasn't it was it, it happened through circumstances we've lived through two two and a half years of the most incredible times uh, so i'm I'm delighted to help put this forward for a proposal because we can use the money we have uh, to help in other areas that boost the economy. Uh, it can only be a good thing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Haywood. Councillor Jeff Young, please. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Chair. Now, not everyone needs to go to university um, uh, and these apprenticeships are um, really needed for youngsters to get into employment and I support it and um, I would like to second it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Yeah. Councillor Jack Rowland, you were going to second, I assume. You put, yep. put your yellow hand down. Incredible speed with which you'll put your yellow hand down as well. You're getting faster and faster now, both up and down. Anyway, enough of that. So, right, <laughs> Amanda. Certainly enough of that. Uh, with, uh, no, moving on. Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, could you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. And that's unanimous in favour, Chair. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. More power to your Thank elbow. You. Really interesting. Thank you for that. Right, nearly there. Uh, the last item is the revised policy on the release of lanterns, balloons and fireworks on council land. Uh, we have a report here, but it's from Peter Blythe. Um, Peter, I don't know if you were preparing to make a presentation or whether you would prefer to assume we've read the report, which we have, and just take questions if anybody had them. Which way would you like to do it? I'm, uh, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to just take questions. I mean, it is a very simple request. We're just basically asking to ban uh, 
ban the release of, release of balloons and fire lanterns and to limit fireworks, which has been to cabinet before, but it got lost because of COVID. So we wanted to just bring it back. Yeah. And yeah. the main the main difference with this ask is that we're asking that it's separated from the drones policy because the drones policy is extremely complicated and will take a long time to resolve. And we need a quick and simple policy on the balloons, et cetera, particularly yeah. fireworks to provide clarity for my colleagues in the events team. So that's yeah. that's it for me. So Okay, thanks, Peter. Fantastic. Yes, I was very surprised after what I thought was policy that had been decided a couple of years ago to keep getting these emails by the ton on people saying, can you take lanterns off council land? And I was, well, we've already done it, but um, but it'd be great to formalise that now. Uh, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Peter, um, sorry if I've missed it in the report, but did, would this include um, land that the district uh, council um, on a long term lease rent out to uh, clubs? Um, pass. I, we were thinking, when I put the paper together, we were thinking more of count land that we manage. But there is the, there is obviously the answer the, the question of things like Exmouth Rugby Club, which we obviously own, but we rent it and they have a fireworks display every year. I don't know. I think that's really a question for someone like Henry as to whether we would have the legal right to do that since they're under a separate lease already. Mm. Okay, that's a very good point. I doubt that Henry could um, rule on that this evening. In any case, no. Chair, well, Chair, shall a... I comment? Shall I comment yes, slightly? Yes, please, Anita. Um, thank you. It, it would depend what's already in the lease agreement. Highly unlikely that the lease precludes that sort of use. So probably it would be OK. Um, it's not it's not something historically we've banned in longer term leases. So presumably, Anita, we could write to all of those uh, things like e.g. Exmouth Rugby mm -hmm. Club to form the run of our new policy, couldn't we? Uh, and then, you know, hope that they adhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we could certainly do that. We could, um, Tim's team can, can deal with writing to them. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right, Councillor, um, who have we got here? Councillor Jeff Young, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I, now, I see the total sense in uh, splitting drones from uh, the rest of the uh, policy. Um, drones is a very complicated and very different uh, issue. Um, we are having issues on the accessory at the moment with drones disturbing um, uh, the wildlife uh, mm. and we've got nothing to um, stop them with at the moment. So we, we need to um, come up with a, a policy for that. And I know that it's going to be quite a complicated task. Um, yeah, things have changed on uh, letting off balloons and, uh, and lanterns. We now identify that they're dangerous. Um, and yeah, um, I totally support this and I would like to recommend it to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I must admit, I, I was not quite aware that this had fallen by the wayside so uh, for so long. Um, I, I thought it had been adopted. Um, I completely understand how that's happened. Um, but um, fully support uh, what's being recommended. And I think it's a very sensible approach to split the two out. Um, so I would be uh, more than happy to second the proposal. Thanks, Councillor Jackson. Another point is being raised, which is, Anita, possibly for you again, is how does this sit with property that is owned by the council, residential property? Probably the same answer than unless it's in our tenancy agreements, it, it is not currently covered. Um, the I'm just looking slightly at John tenancy agreements tend to be managed by way of a central tenancy agreement, so much easier to update it. Um, so that might be something that, that could be considered by way of the central update. OK, thank you. Councillor Haywood, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm mindful of what's been said by Anita and by Henry. I'm just wondering whether a slight amendment might be in order. Uh, firstly, however, I'm grateful to Peter for his report and also to uh, add in the caveat under a recommendation, uh, recommendation two uh, that 
we don't suffer from the law of unintended consequences, rehelium balloons, and the reference has been made here to weather balloons for scientific research, which I'm grateful to see because sometimes that is necessary and we could end up, you know, you know, doing something terrible um but perhaps a recommendation and i'll perhaps look at uh, to anita for advice here that it's that uh cabinet are approved to provide the separation of helium balloons fire lanterns and, and fireworks from the drones policy to approve the separate policy attached something like where the land count on council land where we are have sole responsibility we you know there is no where there is no lease something controlled so, controlled by control our, but, so it's clear, and then, as you suggested quite, quite uh, wisely, Chair, we can then write to the clubs, the leaseholders, and say, We'd we've done this, we would like you to echo this. When the lease perhaps comes around for renewal, it can be included. I certainly agree to, to you couldn't possibly impose this on every single council property. Uh, mm. You know, who would enforce it? But by adding that in, it just quantifies, clarifies this resolution, makes it very clear, and then we use this as a platform to take that forward with our officers at the appropriate time and request that others follow suit for the right reason. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, it's a bit wordy, but that's the principle of what I'm suggesting. You could, Chair, if I may, you, you could perhaps suggest um, that we consider including that in new leases, new commercial leases going forward that Tim's team consider where it's appropriate. Something like Exmouth Rugby Club, they've got a long lease. It's a it's a protected lease. It would be difficult. Mm -hmm. But but you could instruct us to consider it where possible in new leases. Well if if either you or Henry can spend the time that Councillor Gazar is going to be speaking now um, coming up with a refinement on what Councillor Haywood has just said. That would be lovely. Thank you. Councillor Steve Gazar, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just what uh, you said about um, tenancies. Um, I'm thinking of uh, council tenants. Um, would, that, would, would you be suggesting then that any new lease that comes forward for a new tenant would have that in their lease? Because... Um, you know, when you consider the amount of uh, council houses that we've got, and mm. um, uh, just how how you would actually police it um, mm. if it was across the whole um, spectrum of every council uh, tenancy uh, would be a a lot of work, and um, and I just don't know how you would police it. So I'm just wondering whether it, you would be suggesting that it would be if a uh, a council property becomes vacant and we put in new tenants it goes in 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 the new lease that does seem source of the goose source for the gander with the rugby club doesn't it really or, or, or other if we're looking at it as bringing it through new leases rather than try and retrospectively tell existing uh, social housing leaseholders you can't do this that's probably the most elegant way of doing it um However, I'm excitedly watching live drafts personship from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not sure I've finished the exam yet. No, no, might need you just to talk talk amongst yourselves okay, for a moment. I don't okay. think you have any light. Well, that, okay, well, this is the last oh. item this evening, so um, there's not much else we can talk about. Other than, no, other than... I, I would say that when, when no we. Football. I would say that when we when we put this together, we were very much thinking about. The land that we manage because the, the yes. issue the issue is you know someone comes to us and says we want to have a fireworks display or we want to have we want to mass balloon release or we want to have a whatever through up to caitlin in our events team and then mm. we don't know some mm. some members will say no you can't do that because we had this discussion three years ago and other members will say no this isn't the policy yet you must let it go ahead and then we get caught in the middle so that, that was the sort of clarity that we were looking for yeah yeah well whatever that comes from this we must we must do maximum comms on it as well not least to um preserve us members from having these mass email campaigns that keep coming on it anita you're looking ready to produce um, i'm i'm there um can i suggest you add um a, an additional recommendation um that is to instruct officers to consider how such policies could could be applied to the council's tenanted commercial properties um if if you wanted to go the whole hog you could perhaps ask housing to consider the housing stock but i 
I think at the moment that's probably not something we'd want to get into. And, and as you say, comes with the issues of enforcement. And do we really want to stop little Johnny having a, a birthday party with fireworks? It's, it potentially gets more complicated. Um, it's perhaps well, the bigger bigger displays. Yes, that's true. That, is, that would be the, yes. The problem is, so fireworks, yes, uh, for little Johnny. Fire lanterns, no little Johnny. You shouldn't be having those, I suppose, is the mm -hmm. thing. Anyway, Councillor Hookway and Councillor Young, come on, bring us home, please. Well, what I was going to suggest was, uh, Chair, uh, that we send this matter to overview to consider, um, because uh, that will give officers time to think about it, and uh, overview can discuss it. Uh, I think the, the first recommendation is absolutely uh, critical. We should pass that because the, the events team need that. Um, but in terms of what happens about tenancies, I think that should go to overview and let them discuss it, chew it over. Well, I would say that that's an additional recommendation, Nick, probably. I think we should go for it because there is an urgent need to clarify this fire lanterns thing as well. So we ought to really deliver that today uh, and then perhaps ask overview to look at the, you know anything that's more complicated than what Anita has just uh, suggested as the extra recommendation. Uh, Sarah, please, Councillor Jackson. Hey, thank you. <laughs> My hand was being put down, I was putting it back up. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm quite, um, I feel quite strongly about this. Um, I feel we discussed it at great length previously. I think that the, um, I think we need to be bold in what we're doing. And I think the, uh, the understanding when we discussed this previously was that it should apply to all council property. I appreciate that where there are leases in place already, we can't we can't do anything about that. Um, but I think where we've got control over the the terms, including our residential properties, where it's centrally controlled into one tenancy you know, agreement that everyone abides by, I think we should be looking at in, it, implementing that within that policy. Um, as, as a matter of course, um, at the earliest point at which it's renewed. And I say that for all of the same reasons, you know, we, we can't be um, saying to uh, people that want to come and run an event um, at, at some area that we manage, uh, that no, 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 you can't use fire lanterns, for example, um, because they're a risk to thatches, but then not make that clear to other property that's within the district scope. Um, so I think we need to be bold on that personally. Um, and I think that honors the intention behind the original discussions. Um, I personally would like to see that come out of these discussions rather than be taken further, you know, further down the line. You know, we've, we've been approached, a number of us have been approached by residents who are putting forward these RSPCA uh, and similar um, emails around this subject. And we've been going back in good faith to say, no, no, our council policy has changed, it's this. And obviously that hasn't been implemented. So I think it won't be seen um, by those that are passionate about this, um, that we're doing anything other than sort of backpedaling a little bit if we don't apply this wherever we possibly can. Um, and I think it's important that any new leases, commercial ones, take this on and where there are lease um, renewal discussions and there's scope to uh, negotiate this into that, that lease agreement, I think we should be doing it. I think we need to be quite clear about the, the fundamental principles behind what this, the original um, proposal, you know, the essence of it. We, we, need, to, um, we need to stick by that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Jackson. And hopefully on page 240 with those, uh, the key points of the recommendations there at two, I think that does capture that. And then with the addition of Anita's uh, drafting for the extra recommendation, hopefully that's quite a strong signal tonight, I think. I hope it is. Um, um, and then we can maybe, you know, toughen up even more later. Um, so you've got uh, Councillor Young, Councillor Haywood, minute each if you can. Yeah, um, just very quickly. Um, if we impose it on um, our 
uh, tenanted um, properties uh, um, for for residents, um, that would be very unfair because you will have uh, people who own their own properties will be able to have bonfires and people who've got to live in council houses won't. And I can see the headline now. So I think we've got to look very carefully at that and we need to... Um, um, now uh, go to government and ask them to basically stop it full stop um, but I don't think we can stop it in one uh, set of houses and not in another uh, so I, I propose that we go with the proposal with uh, Anita's um, amendment thank you very much okay thank you um, Councillor Hayward 60 seconds if you can won't even take that long chair um, obviously I'm, I'm happy to support the additional amendment as proposed by Anita. Well, any town and parish council representatives watching this take a steer from East Devon District Council if they own land that they follow suit. And then you can do this among, across the whole of East Devon too. Thank you. Thank you. Final word, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, only in response to Councillor Young's point, which I do take on board what, what he's, he's saying there, but um, with all due respect, there are clauses in our tenancy agreements that apply to council tenants that don't apply to private tenants in private residences and vice versa, um, such as use of, of lofts and attics. So um, I'm not sure that that's really, uh, <laughs> that's, that's really, I mean, it's fundamentally, it's up to us what goes into those tenancy agreements, although I do recognise that it might not be palatable for some. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally, we're really cool about uh, lanterns being released and helium balloons being released, or we're not. Uh, one of those, just one of those, can cause huge damage. So we, we can't ignore that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, before the balloon goes up or the fireworks start up, can we go to a vote on this, please? Uh, Amanda. Certainly, Chair. Councillors, if you could vote, please. Sorry, I'm not entirely clear what the actual amendment is. I, I'm not, oh, I'm not sure I've seen that. Shall, I, shall I read it, Chair? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly, Chair. Um, to ask officers to consider how such policies, as in the policies you're just recommending, um, could be applied to the council's tenanted commercial properties. Yeah. Okay. And that that would be something for Tim's team to to take forward, and we can we can do that with them. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, got the how, how about residential? Because that, that's not picked up from there at all. No, I I think if I may, Chair, I think um, that does raise bigger issues. We would have to consider how appropriate, given that this is people's homes, how appropriate it is to limit their use of those homes. It might be doable. I'm not saying it isn't, but but it, it is um, a bigger consideration. It's something we could assist John's team with. I, I just worry slightly that with the resourcing issues that are going on at the moment, it may not be something that that is is key for the moment. And we do have those issues of enforcing. Are we going to send somebody around if if Johnny's mum has a birthday party and sets off fireworks? I think that that becomes a, a difficult. Certainly we we can look at it as long as we we it turns out that on an equalities impact assessment, we're not adversely affecting one particular group of people. Um, well, that's what I'm asking, John. In, yes, thank you. So we, let's note that this is something we'd like to look at uh, moving forward, but for tonight, probably that's as much as we can do. It would be pretty uh, awkward for us if it was reported in the Express and Echo tomorrow that we just uh, banned fireworks in our, in our social housing, um, you know, uh, much as, you know, some people might like to. Sarah, final word. <laughs> I think I'd just be more comfortable if it was part of the recommendation that we were voting on, that we were exploring that rather than just leaving it. I feel it will fall, fall by the wayside if it's not. Um, okay. Just yeah. that. So, so a, a, similar, a similar amendment, Chair, to ask officers to consider how such policies could be applied to the Council's HRA properties. Excellent. Councillor Jackson, happy with that. 
Councillor Young, happy. Everybody who proposed and seconded it, I kind of no idea who any of you are. Um, happy with it. Good. Um, so I tell you, what, let, let's, can we, Amanda, I'm so sorry, can we put our hands down, the, the, the ticks down, and let's vote on that again then to make sure we've got clarity. So let's have another go, please, Cabinet. of the amended recommendation, Chair. Thank you very much, Amanda. Now, on the basis that anybody other than the uh, 14 of us <laughs> watching this, I will now read the Chair's closing words. That brings our meeting to an end, and I'd like to thank everyone for taking part. Can I remind members that Democratic Services will confirm when the meeting is no longer going live, as your comments may still be recorded. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you, Simon, John, Amanda.